it's not easy to commit so many horrible atrocities that people say, this guy is just as bad as Hitler, maybe worse. But Pol Pot pulled that off. If we're talking about the most evil people of the last hundred years, people whose leadership led to more death and despair than anyone else's in the world, we should mention the Soviet Union's Joseph Stalin, right? Bad dude, very bad. We've covered him here on Time Suck. Uh, China's Mao Zedong, another terrible, soulless, heartless bastard. And we should also mention Pol Pot. Cambodia is still recovering from what he did in the 1970s. All these guys arguably as bad as Hitler. And other than Hitler, all three were communists. It's almost like communism is not a good idea. It's almost like it's a horrific form of government that no one should ever try again, ever. Under the Khmer Rouge's short and terrible reign led by Pol Pot, the Cambodian state controlled all aspects of a citizen's life. Money, private property, jewelry, gambling, most reading material, religion, all illegal. The punishment for just about every crime, death. The punishment for being just about anything other than a farmer before the Khmer Rouge took over, death. So much death under Pol Pot. Agriculture was collectivized. Children were taken from their homes and forced into the military. Even strict rules governed sexual relations, vocabulary, and clothing, all laid down by the state. Between 1.4 million and 2.2 million people would lose their lives from execution, disease, starvation, and overwork under Pol Pot's horrific vision and terrible delusional leadership. He thought all of what he did would make the people happier. At least that's what he told himself. The dude was an insane, bloodthirsty idiot, and we're going to learn all about him and what he did to Cambodia in today's How the Hell Does This Shit Ever Happen? edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> you're listening to Time Suck. <laughs> Work and wait, meat sacks. It's time for Time Suck. Happy Monday, you motherfuckers. You beautiful bastards. Coming in hot today. Oh, I'm feeling, got some, new, got some new headphones. Got some new in-ears. I feel like I'm just talking to you guys now. Oh, I feel so different. I'm Dan Cummins. Brother suck. The master sucker. Suck nasty. You're listening to Time Suck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hail Nimrod. Be gone, Lucifine. I can't focus with you around today. Praise Bojangles. Don't let all the commie talk today. Rally you up too bad, Bojangles. And glory be to Triple M. Hoping I had fun in Brooklyn and Washington, D.C. this past weekend. I had to record this last week. Did have fun in Las Vegas. Six fun shows at Kimmel's Comedy Club. All fun crowds. Uh, I, I just might come back to Vegas after all. Uh, the Toxic Thoughts Tour heads to the rec room in Huntington Beach, California, for Valentine, Valentine's Day weekend. Head to the OC. At least one show sold out there uh, already. Then it's off to St. Louis and Salt Lake City, where multiple shows have already sold out. So get those tickets. They are, they are truly going fast. Then it's Nashville, Philly, Honolulu, Hawaii, and so much more. Uh, all the tour dates up at dancummins.tv. And now let's talk charity. Love that we can give. Giving $4,200 this month to the Equal Justice Initiative, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that provides legal representation to people who have been illegally convicted, unfairly sentenced, or abused in state jails and prison. EGI.org. Head there to learn more. Link in the episode description. Uh, more dirt bags on shirts this week. Uh, the Class of Hell yearbook, yearbook series continues this week. Uh, Albert uh, Showbiz Fish, Joseph Worst Dad Ever Fritzel, and uh, Andre Walters Big Deal Chikatilo. They're on. They're on on shirts now. Get them before they leave the store. At least uh, look at them. <laughs> they're ridiculous. They're 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 some funky looking shirts. I really I yeah I really like them. They're dark, but we goofed them up, so they're not they're not too dark. Uh, finally, quick note about an audio issue uh, we've been receiving some messages about. Uh, we are aware that for a small percentage of our listeners, these episodes seem to have been randomly glitching and skipping around lately. Uh, I want you to know we have complained to our hosting platform. That's where the problem lies. They are aware of the issue. They have a lot of other shows, shows like Small Town Murder, Crime and Sports, right? James and Jimmy dealing with the same shit. Uh, other people experiencing the same thing. And they're supposedly currently trying to sort it all out. That's what they tell us. So sorry. Uh, unfortunately, the issue is out of our hands uh, it doesn't seem to be directly linked to any single streaming platform, and, and hopefully they just fix that annoying bug soon. So much technology. It's so wonderful when it works. More cool stuff we get, the more things that can go wrong. But I'll take it. I'll, I'll take the bad with the good. Oh, well. Things can be much worse than occasional audio skippage. Way worse. Like uh, Khmer Rouge worse. Let's get into it. Say 
since the mass deaths, uh, the, since the mass deaths carried out by the Khmer Rouge while under Pol Pot's leadership have come to be known as not only the killing fields, but also as the Cambodian genocide, let's start off by defining genocide. The term genocide was co- coined by a Polish writer and attorney, uh, Rafael Lemkin, in 1941, which, which makes sense. Mr. Lemkin was the first Polish person ever to learn how to read, write, uh, walk upright, go to school, graduate from law school. Uh, he was the first Polish person to do a lot of things for the Polish people. Uh, before this, uh, you know, for this guy, Polish people, all they ever did was catch and eat rodents with their bare hands, uh, play with their dirty butts, and try with limited success to set everything they could find on fire. Anyway, uh, Mr. Lemkin formed this new word, genocide, by combining the Greek word genos, meaning race, with the Latin word side, meaning killing. Of course, he couldn't build the word out of uh, two words in the same language. <laughs> what a fucking idiot! Uh, and if you're a little shocked by my Polish sentiments, well, listen up, new guy or new gal. Sometimes I take cheap shots at my wife's heritage here on the suck, as opposed to just being, you know, randomly racist. Try, try not to think too much about it. I know that Raphael Lemkin was not an idiot. Not at all. Uh, he was amazing, actually. He was a successful prosecutor and attorney in Poland before World War II. He was the public prosecutor in Warsaw, became a private attorney. In addition to being Polish, he was also Jewish, and he was just barely able to escape to Sweden when the Nazis invaded Poland. And while he would survive the war, he lost 49 relatives to the Nazis. 49. Holy shit. Only his brother, sister-in-law, and their two children survived the concentration camps out of his family tree. The entire rest of his living family tree died. How crazy is that? Imagine if everyone related to you outside of one brother, right? Your brother's wife and their two boys were killed by some crazy regime. After escaping to Sweden... I made it to the U.S., joining the law faculty at Duke University in 1941. In November 1944, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace published Lemkin's most important work entitled Axis Rule in Occupied Europe. The book included an extensive legal analysis of German rule in countries occupied by Nazi Germany during the course of World War II, along with the definition of this new term, genocide. Lemkin's idea of genocide as an offense against international law was widely accepted by the international community and was one of the legal bases for the post-World War II Nuremberg trials, notable for sentencing many Nazis to death for, among other war crimes, engineering the Holocaust genocide. Genocide is defined by the United Nations in 1948 means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, including killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mentally harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Basically, being accused of committing or conspiring to commit genocide means that if you are guilty, you've about maxed out on how evil one person can be. A little more serious than, say, uh, you know, jaywalking or not paying a parking ticket. And the Cambodian, Cambodian genocide was one, of the, uh, was one of numerous genocides and mass killings carried out in the 20th century. It's terrible how uh, often these type of things have occurred overall. Here's just a few other examples of terrible mass killings and or genocides from the last hundred years or so. The worst mass murder on record in the 20th century took place in China under the leadership of Mao Zedong. The bulk of the killings happened between 1958 and 1961, and then again between 1966 and 1969. No one really knows what the real numbers are, but it's estimated that as many as uh, somewhere between 49 and 78 million people were exterminated under Mao Zedong's heinous totalitarian rule. From just 1958 to 1961, at least 45 million Chinese were worked, starved, tortured, and beaten to death during Zedong's Great Leap Forward. 45 million. The Great Leap Forward, China's brutal effort to catch up with the economy of the Western world, Mao decreed that an increased effort to multiply grain yields and industry should be brought to the Chinese countryside, and chaos and death followed his decision. A third of all Chinese homes were destroyed to obtain raw materials for collective projects. How insane is that? They need to build material, they need it quickly for, you know, for industrial, you know, uh, improvements and agricultural improvements, so they just took motherfuckers' homes, just kicked them out. Use the building materials to build factories, storage silos, you know, shitty state housing units, etc. Yay communism. 
Uh, private farming was now prohibited under Mao Zedong's rule. Rural farmers were forced to work on collective farms where all production, resource allocation, and food distribution was centrally controlled by the barbaric Communist Party there. Local officials were terrified of the consequences of not fulfilling insane agricultural quotas based on what the delusional Mao thought could be accomplished. So to cover their own asses, to, cut, to save their own lives, these administrators collected surpluses that in fact did not exist. So they ended up taking all or, you know, damn near all of the food from rural farmers, leaving millions who hadn't already been worked to death to starve. And the irony of farmers starving to death when they're, you know, harvesting all these crops, crops that they would be executed if they were, you know, found eating more than their uh, ration. And the rations weren't enough to live on. The Great Leap Forward was more of a giant kick in the dick. It's one of the greatest tragedies in history of the world. Uh, in the history of the world, the, the, I mean, the lives of tens of millions of rural peasants, completely and totally disposable in Mao's eyes. We got to suck Zedong one of these days. And yes, I know how that sounds. Got to suck Zedong. Uh, that dude helped build China into a world power. China wouldn't be the superpower it is today without him. But he was also a huge piece of shit. Millions and millions sacrificed for what he thought was the greater good. Needless mass, mass death also occurred in Africa. The Congo genocide, a.k.a. the rubber terror of the late 19th and early 20th century, lasted from 1886 to 1908, thought to have taken as many as 8 million souls, wiped them from the face of the earth. This massive loss of life occurred under the reign of Leopold II, king of the Belgians. The Congo Free State was at the time a Belgian colony. And the Belgians wanted to make as much rubber money as possible and make it as quickly as possible and uh, make it at any expense to local Congolese life. The ruler of uh, the Belgians truly did not give a single fuck what happened to those people. Rubber suddenly became highly in demand for various industrial uses, various commercial uses worldwide, and the Congo had a shitload of rubber trees, which was terrible news for almost everyone living there. Millions of locals went from being really, really poor to really, really dead. You know, just, yay, there's a market for rubber! Hooray for the Congo! Finally, my people will be rich! Not so fast, local. The Belgians control this land, and even though many of you have never even seen a Belgian and will never see one, they are going to make all the rubber money, like literally all of it. But don't worry, you'll get at least to be a very important part of the new rubber trade. So that's pretty cool. The Belgians are going to work you to death getting out all that rubber. Harvesting rubber isn't going to make rich Belgian industrialists more rich, <laughs> not unless they can access free labor. That's going to make them filthy rich, you silly goose, and you're going to be that free labor. Thanks to this new market, you're going to remain just as poor as before, if not more poor, but you're going to have to work oh so much more. Slavery is technically over, but you're going to be slaves, you motherfuckers, and you're going to die. Now get to work. That's basically what it was. Uh, the Belgian government gave Belgian industrialists free fucking reign to do whatever they wanted to do to produce as much rubber as possible, forced labor, violent coercion, used to collect rubber cheaply. A native paramilitary, uh, paramilitary army was created to enforce inhuman labor policies. Any individual workers who refused to participate in rubber collection could be and often would be killed. Sometimes entire uncooperative villages were just burnt to the ground, just destroyed to send a message to other villages to either, you know, do your fucking rubber work or everyone you know will be executed. Makes our current, uh, you know, polarized political system not seem so bad, right? And that's not an endorsement or a complaint about Washington, D.C. It's just saying, uh, you know, we don't have the same kind of political problems, right? My God, holy shit, do we have it a lot better than those poor bastards did. Uh, now let's head to Russia. Can't talk about mass killings without at least touching on good old bloodthirsty 20th century mother Russia. Stalin's forced Ukrainian famine of 1932 and 1933, known as the Holodomor. Another example of millions of people viewed as being entirely disposable by you know, their government needlessly dying. And this is just one of many really shitty things Stalin did. He put oh so many people to death. Uh, the Holomador might be the worst atrocity that evil shitlord signed off on. Uh, we talked about this particular genocide in our KGB suck, 138. Also in the Chikatilo serial killer episode way back in suck 57. What is big deal? Holomador is big deal. Had not Holomador happened, maybe Chikatilo, parent of, had better nourishment. Maybe Chikatilo have better gene pool water. Maybe Chikatilo have been born not with limp soft shamecock. Maybe Chikatilo have been born with great hard penis and Russian leader instead of a creeper wrestler. The Holomador was a really big deal. It was a man-made famine. It's been recognized as a genocide by 16 different nations. Somewhere between 3 and 12 million Ukrainians starved to death. 
uh, Holodomor, Ukrainian for death by hunger, and ethnic Ukrainians were worked to death on communist communal farms, where the food they planted and grew and harvested was sent to the Communist Party members in Russia, whose lives were deemed more valuable, very similar to Mao Zedong's Great Leap Forward, right? Make these poor peasants harvest all this shit, but then don't let them eat it. Let them starve. Let some other people eat it. Uh, the Nazis, as I imagine we all know, certainly no strangers to genocide and mass murder. Around 6 million Jewish people put to death by the Nazis for no other reason uh, than the fact that they were born Jewish. We touched on the Holocaust and a number of sucks, uh, rec- and recently as well, so no need to go further into it here. One of these days, we do need to do a full suck on just the Holocaust. Too many deniers out there who, who don't believe it happened. It's so insulting. And before the Holocaust, another mass genocide occurred in Europe. The Armenian genocide doesn't get talked about enough. This is a topic we need to do down the road. The Ottomans committed the Armenian genocide in Turkey, where over 1.5 million Armenians were systematically rounded up and killed or deported from 1915 to 1918. After the Holocaust, the Armenian genocide is the second most studied genocide in the world. This genocide was carried out during and after World War I, implemented in two phases, the wholesale killing of the able-bodied male population through massacre and subjection of army conscripts to forced labor, followed by the deportation of women, children, the elderly, and the infirm on death marches leading to the Syrian desert. Driven forward by military escorts, the deportees were deprived of food and water, subjected to, subjected to periodic robbery, rape, and massacre. Why? Essentially because the Ottomans were Muslims and the Armenians were Christian. And even worse in the Ottomans' eyes, they were successful Christians. The Armenians were flourishing, living in a Muslim nation, and many Muslims who weren't doing as well greatly resented them for their success. Historically, a minority ethnic or cultural or religious group seeming to be more financially successful than the majority culture around them hasn't worked out well, right? That that little group tends to become a perfect scapegoat for politicians looking to uh, easily improve their lot in life via a revolution, get some quick votes by shitting on some uh, people, putting the blame on them, you know, nonsensically. Uh, the Ottomans were worried that during World War I, the Armenians would betray them and side with nearby Russia, at the time another Christian nation, so there's a little paranoia going on. The Ottoman rulers also felt that some of the Armenians have been getting a little fucking uppity lately. They didn't know their place. How dare they not accept being second-class citizens, because that's what they were at that time. The Armenians had been taxed more than the Muslims for generations, banned from holding certain political offices, denied other basic citizen rights that were afforded you know, to Muslims, And they just recently began to push to have more rights, to have the same rights as their Muslim neighbors. How dare they want to be treated fairly? Rather than try and work things out with them, rather than treat them equally, the uh, shitty rulers of the day, the young Turks, these ruthless bastards, decided to kill and expel the Armenians in mass. There have been many other mass killings and genocides. The governments of North Korea, Indonesia, Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Angola, Iran, Kurdistan. So many other nations have all directly caused hundreds of thousands of innocent citizens to die just in the last century. And genocides continue to this day. We made a list of every mass murder over two, uh, that, uh, you know, where over 20,000 people died that have occurred in the last 120 years. And it was so extensive, we decided not to include it because it would just be reading this very, very long, repetitious list of, and then this piece of shit killed these people. And then this piece of shit killed those people. And then you wouldn't believe what this piece of shit did and on and on for like an hour. Super long, tedious list would also do a grave disservice to the victims of Pol Pot's regime. It would make mass murder almost feel like it wasn't that big of a deal. You know, it is a very big deal. But I did want to include at least some other atrocities to remind you that as insanely tragic as the Cambodian genocide was, it was far from the only extremely tragic event in the world that occurred in the 20th century alone. Historically, people just haven't gotten along with other people who don't look, speak, act, or think like they do. That's why racism is so dangerous. That's why xenophobia is so dangerous. It's called tribalism. And we as a species have still not figured out how to get the fuck over it, right? Trying to get past tribalism, trying to get away from that us versus them mentality is one of the reasons I like to throw around the term meat sack. What if we eased up on defining ourselves by racial and cultural and religious and political lines? What if we, you know, we're just team meat sack first and foremost, humans first, everything else second. Everything else, even being a citizen, should come second. The world's gotten smaller, you know, smaller than it's ever been in so many ways. And I think the, uh, you know, the more of us who can think of ourselves as global citizens, the better off Earth will be. Someone born inside a different border than you isn't all that different from you. Now, when you strip away a lot of the shit that, you know, that their different government or their culture, you know, pushed into the soft spots of their head when they were developing, 
Underneath it all, they're just another carbon-based mammal hoping to get in as many smiles and feel-good moments as they can before the Reaper brings his damn scythe on by. Do I think that means we should just open up our borders, you know, to, to anyone and everyone and just get rid of our military and hope for the best? Fuck no. But it should remind us to be a little more compassionate and empathetic to others who don't belong to, uh, you know, what we think of as our tribe, whatever that may look like. Okay. Now, before we get to know Pol Pot, in the first of today's two Time Suck Timelines, let's take a quick gander at something that several of the genocidal countries of the 20th century had in common, good old communism. Oh, man, if you happen to be uh, pro-communist, <laughs> this is not going to be a fun episode for you. Uh, e- easy, Bojangles. Oh, Jesus Christ. Our, our one-eyed, three-legged pit bull suck mascot just took an immediate shit on the rug in protest of communism even being brought up. He's, he's fired up. Uh, he, he's ready to head back to the jungles of South America or Vietnam, wherever he thinks some communists might be hiding. Bo- Bojangles hates communism. We've gone over communism and its definition several times on episodes in the past, including our Vietnam suck. KGB suck and our Stalin suck and more. Let's just go over the basics today. According to communist writers and thinkers, the goal of communism is to create a stateless, classless society. And like I've said so many times, okay, maybe that sounds nice uh, in theory, I guess. It fucking blows in practice. Communist thinkers believe a classless society can happen only if people take away the power of the bourgeoisie, the ruling class, who own the means of production and establish worker control of the means of production. And again, that sounds nice in theory. The little guy gets to run the show. Yay! Rudy, 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 Rudy. But the problem here is that whichever workers, whichever little guys end up getting put in charge of everything, end up getting in charge of, you know, overseeing the transition from capitalism to communal living, well, they end up becoming the new rulers. Every time. To establish and maintain rule, they seem to damn near always resort to becoming ruthless rulers themselves. And now instead of being beholden to the factory owner, now you're beholden to the communist leader. And while the factory owner maybe didn't pay you enough, while the factory owner, you know, they could fire your ass, even unfairly, and that could, that could you know, cause a lot of harm in your life. Well, the communist leader can fucking kill you. And, and they, that's ten, that tends to be what they've done over and over again. While the term communism can refer to specific political parties, at its core, communism is an ideology, an ideology of economic equality through the elimination of of private property, which again, in my opinion, is shit. But of course I think that, I guess I'm an American. Owning land, part of the American dream, a dream I've bought into heavily. Call me crazy, but I think dangling the carrot of property ownership in front of the average citizen encourages them to work a little harder so that one day they don't have to pay a mortgage and can dream of passing something on to their children or to a charity of their choosing, as opposed to working their whole life and then hoping the state honors its deal to take care of them once they retire and become of little use to the state and then not be able to pass on anything to anyone when they die. Hope. Humans live so much on hope for a better future or a future that continues to be good. Communism doesn't leave a lot of room for hope. I'm going to try and keep the rest of my opinions to myself on communism, at least while I'm just trying to explain what it is. I just fucking hate it so much. The more I study it, the more I hate it. It reminds me of, it reminds me of group projects I had to do back in school. I, I hated group projects because I, I seemed to end up doing most of the work most of the time, you know, so, so uh, everyone in my group could get a good grade because I wanted a good grade. Maybe I was just unlucky, but I kept getting stuck with other kids who didn't give a shit uh, about their report cards, not as much as I did. You know, it pissed me off that even though like uh, one of the kids in the group, you know, just literally would just dick around and not do shit, that clown would get the same grade as the rest of us. Another reason I hate communism, man. individual effort not rewarded enough. And I say all this as someone who is not opposed to having, you know, uh, more socialist policies in America. Like, 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 you know, I wouldn't mind a, a bigger base layer of healthcare coverage, a, a bigger base layer of free higher education for legal citizens. I'm not some elitist, not some fuck the little guy, classist, capitalistic pig. I'm in favor of the little guy and, and the little gal. I've always rooted for the underdog. In communism, it pretends to be in favor of the underdog. But in reality, it fucks over the common man and the woman more than any other system of government I've ever studied. It's phony. It's a lie. It's bullshit. Now I'm going to try and get my soapbox for real. The beliefs of communism, most famously expressed by Karl Marx, who I wish I could go back time and fucking choke to death, center on the idea that inequality and suffering result from capitalism. Oh, party my tongue. Under capitalism, communists believe private business people, co- corporations, you know, they own all the factories, equipment, other resources, the means of production. These owners, according to communist doctrine, can then exploit workers. Sure who are forced to uh, sell their labor for wages. Yeah, okay. 
the working class, it's never perfect, uh, the working class or proletariat has to rise up against the capitalist owners. The bourgeoisie, according to the ideals of communism, institute a new society with no private property, no economic classes, and no profits. Mm Mm-hmm. No profits. Just, just, Just trying to bite my tongue. Communist theory predicts that after the proletariat revolution, special leaders must temporarily take control of the state, leading it towards an eventual true communist society where everyone's really equal. There's no leadership, right? The, the governments of the Soviet Union, communist China, Cuba, others, they're, they're, they were just supposed to be provisional, just, just temporary. You know, these temporary governments, you know, were, uh, you know, were just supposed to kind of, you know, get things going on the right course and then step back. But that hasn't happened, has it? No, these temporary governments have uh, held on to power and become ruthless like every fucking time. And why have they held on to power? You know, every time that I'm aware of, because it goes against historical human nature for those who have a lot of power to relinquish it and become the powerless. Powerful leaders do not ever seem to just want to step down and just become a common citizen again. It's a nice thought for someone to be like, well, well, set now. Go enjoy this fine commune. I hope I hope y'all keep things running. I'm going to leave my fancy estate behind and just, uh, you know, let go of being able to pretty much boss everyone around and do whatever I want. And I'm just going to step down and I don't know, go make soap or some shit with some other villagers and sleep in a hut. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. That shit doesn't happen. Communist ideology also states that these revolutions should spread across the globe rather than be limited to individual countries. If the world was communist, the whole world, there would be, in theory, no need for ruthless leaders because the state would not have to be protected from and prepared for war because there would be no opposing factions. This belief in a world takeover helps explain the historical antagonism between capitalist and communist nations, right? Particularly the long Cold War between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The big red scare, man, that was was a valid fear. It was something we should have been afraid of. I'm I'm glad Bojangles left a little while ago and wasn't able to hear all of uh, what I just said. He he would have gotten so riled up. He would have have chewed his way out of the fucking suck dungeon, just eaten his way right to the wall or something. Now, before we go into uh, Cambodia's story, uh, let's let's meet this week's piece of shit, Pol Pot. First, a little overview. Then our first of two timelines for the week. Pol Pot, he's always been somewhat of a mystery. He used a lot of names during his life, was always careful to hide his motivations, believing that secrecy was the key to gaining the upper hand in conflict. We'll have to use our best guesses to piece together certain moments from his timeline. He tried to rewrite his narrative several times. He's like a real-life Bond villain. Uh, Until he was elected prime minister, no one knew who Pol Pot was, not at least as Pol Pot. For over two years after his takeover in April of 1975, he revealed almost nothing about himself. The world didn't know who this dude was, which is super weird. I mean, imagine if the U.S. or Great Britain or Russia, China, or some other superpower announced tomorrow that they had a new leader, but they just wouldn't say who it was. Just just like someone in a Cobra commander mask or some shit, sitting on a throne, just telling people what to do. Someone find Destro. Tell him to stop fooling around with Baroness and help me destroy the citizens of Earth. Not saying Cambodia was a superpower. Uh, You know, it wasn't, uh, and it isn't. But super weird for that to happen just in any country in modern history. Pol Pot, he kind of was like a Cobra commander. Uh, When he made a state visit to China in September uh, September 1977, he was photographed there. Cambodia watchers identified Pol Pot as a 52-year-old former school teacher named Salath Sar who had been the secretary of the Central Committee of the Clandestine Communist Party of Kampuchea, former name of Cambodia, uh, since 1963. Pol Pot had, had announced the existence of the CPK to the outside world for the first time in a triumphal speech recorded from radio, recorded for Radio Phnom Penh just before he left China, or left for China, excuse me. And even after he visited China, very few Cambodians knew that Pol Pot was Salah Sar. Most didn't know who this dude was until after he was overthrown a few years later when he finally admitted it, uh, admitted his former identity. Pol Pot was his revolutionary name when he announced his pseudonym in 1976. He followed precedents uh, set by several communist leaders, including Lenin, Stalin, Ho Chi Minh. The intentions of these other communist leaders was to conceal their true identities from the police in the days leading up to their you know, respective revolutions and also to inspire their followers. You know, Stalin, for example, means steal. Ho Chi Minh means enlightened one. Pol Pot is thought to have been short for the French word politique potentiel, potential politics. Right? This is like, this is a new type of politics. So who was Salah Sar though? Who's the man behind Pol Pot? Why did he ever think communism was the answer to Cambodia's problems? Let, let's get to know this ding dong in today's Time Suck Timeline. 
Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Pol Pot is believed to have been born May 19th, 1925 in the uh, Kampong uh, Tom province in Cambodia, even though his official birth date is May 25th, 1928. There's a lot of mysteries around this guy. We're going to proceed as if he was born in 1925. That's what most people seem to kind of believe. Uh, his birth name, as you, as you just learned, you know, Salath Sar, which to me sounds kind of like a Star Wars character, right? Doesn't it? Sounds, sounds like a Sith. Salath Sar, horn dude, you know, fights with, you know, maybe three lightsabers. Hates Jedi's and Ewoks. Strongly sexually attracted to Chewbacca. Apprentice of Darth Bane. Rides a hoverboard. Rocks a rat tail. I don't know. I'm painting a picture in my mind. Anyway, Salazar's parents were ethnic uh, Khmer. 97% of Cambodia are ethnic Khmer. Uh, the Khmer speak the Khmer language, are typically Buddhists. And by the way, it, it is pronounced, pronounced Khmer. Watched a lot of docs for this one. There's several pronunciation guides. It seems to be uh, said that way every time. And I, and I say this as a preemptive strike. Got some emails, giving me some, this is how you say it, advice, which is nice. But this week, the suggestions uh, seem to be wrong. Maybe, maybe said differently in French or native Cambodian. Pretty sure it's Khmer uh, in English. I uh, love you guys. Okay, there are over 15 million Khmer people living in Cambodia today, with about 1.5 million living in Vietnam, uh, over a million in Thailand, over 300,000 in the U.S., most of whom are either people who fled Pol Pot's Khmer uh, Rouge or their descendants. After that, there are about 80,000 in France, 50,000 in South Korea, 40,000 in Australia, 30,000 in Malaysia, 25,000 in Canada, and then it dips substantially. There, there aren't many other Khmer uh, Rouge in the world. No other country has more than 10,000. Overall, the Khmer uh, people, a fairly small Asian ethnic group, you know, comparatively. Salas was born in the village of Preg Subao, tiny fishing village. Less than 10 houses today. And by houses, I mean tiny, dilapidated dwellings that sit atop of, uh, stilts, you know, so they don't get flooded by the river below them. Buildings in what uh, looks to be uh, some sort of kind of tropical swamp. Buildings I would ask for my money back if I bought one to use as a shed. Uh, looks, looks pretty rough there. Uh, things were a bit better in this village when Pol Pot was a child. They were definitely better for him and his family. They were big fishes in this very small pond. They may have lived in a little village, but they weren't hurting for money. You know, they were connected. More on that in a bit. Salas little village sat less than uh, two miles west of the provincial capital of Kampong Tom, little city of about 30,000. Very rural, you know, got a rural vibe, a lot of open air markets, still mostly uh, dirt roads based on some travel videos I watched. Some 90 miles north of Phnom Penh, Cambodia's largest city, a city of over 2 million. Uh, Phnom Penh was uh, once known as the Pearl of Asia. It was considered to be one of the loveliest French built cities in Asia in the 1920s, back when the French were all up in Southeast Asia's ass. Cambodia had become a French protectorate, being essentially colonized back in the late 19th century. Saloth's father, Pen Saloth, was a prosperous farmer with 50 acres, 10 times the amount of land possessed by the average farmer, farmer at the time. So he had rice land, he had several draft cattle, comfortable tile-roofed house. His neighbors may have lived in sheds on stilts, goddammit, but he lived in a sweet-ass tiled super cool shed, like a luxury shed. Kind of like a gated community type shed. Uh, Salat Sar's mother, Saknem, was uh, widely respected in the district for her piety, community involvement, for being hot as fuck. Uh, she apparently was a looker. Salat was the eighth of nine children, two of whom were girls. Five of the nine survived all the way into the 1990s. Uh, in addition to having a little more land than their neighbors, something else that set Pol Pot's family apart from others in the region were its connections to the royal palace in Phnom Penh. Cambodia had and still does have a royal family. Uh, the Cambodian royals, when Salath was born, were basically puppet leaders, while the French really controlled things. Uh, before the French controlled uh, Cambodia, it was a proper kingdom. Back in the 12th century, the Khmer Empire was actually Southeast Asia's largest and most powerful kingdom. They had a good run. Over 1,100 square miles in size, its capital, Angar, uh, was the largest pre-industrial city in the entire world. In its 12th century temple, Angar Wat is the largest religious monument existing in the world. It's beautiful. Uh, I hope to see it firsthand someday. Salazar's cousin Meek joined the Royal Ballet in the 1920s in the closing years of the reign of King Sisawath, who reigned from 1904 to 1927. Meek was another hot little thing, hail Lucifina, and she soon became a consort of the king's eldest son, Prince Sisawath uh, Monavong. She bore him a son, Kosarak, shortly before Monavong became king in 1927. He would rule until 1941. Uh, dude had lots of consorts. 
which was totally allowed and normal, even expected for Cambodian royalty. He had at least six officially recognized consorts, letting the French, French actually run things while he lived in luxury and had sex with his consorts and occasionally put on a crown and waved to his people. That was his life. Seems like a pretty cushy life. In the late 1920s, Sar's older brother, Loth Swang, went to Phnom Penh to work as royal palace clerk. Swang worked in the palace as a clerk until 1975, actually. And in the early 1940s, married another royal dancer, Che Sami. Uh, again, his family was connected. They existed on the periphery of luxury. Salah's sister, Salah Rong, or Roing, uh, also joined the ballet. Uh, and at some point in the 1930s, became a consort, consort as well. Consort of King Monavong. A lot of hot ladies related to Pol Pot. Uh, when he was a young man, he was said to be extremely handsome. They were lookers, the pots. It wasn't really the pots, it was the SARS. Uh, they had it good. Lots of land, connections, you know, attractive. Why would Salah have to go fucking full commie later? Ruin it, ruin all this stuff. Uh, interesting that Pol Pot seemed to have had so many connections to the Cambodian monarchy. He never spoke much about these connections later, emphasizing his humble beginnings and roots as a farmer, which wasn't really that true. He wasn't the son of a humble farmer. He was the son of a prosperous farmer, closely related to the royal family. In early 1934, when Salah Star was eight, he and an older brother went to live with his cousin and consort of King Monavong in Phnom Penh. Live in a, they lived in a royal residence for an unknown period of time. Some sources say he was six when he went. Again, the timeline of his early childhood, a little inconsistent from source to source because as I pointed out earlier, we don't know exactly when he was born, 1928 or 1925. Uh, some biographies also say he spent a year going to school at a Buddhist monastery when he first moved to Phnom Penh, then later went to Catholic school. More biographies say he went to a Roman Catholic primary school when he first arrived in Phnom Penh, the Ecole uh, Mish, while his cousin Meek uh, paid his tuition fees. Most of his classmates were the children of French bureaucrats at this school and Catholic Vietnamese. He became literate in French and familiar with Christianity at this time. He also struggled heavily in school. Salath was not academically gifted. All sources seem to agree on that. He was held back two years in school. When Pol Pot lived there, uh, you know, Phnom Penh was a sleepy, sun-drenched town that had been established as the capital of a French uh, protectorate in 1866. The city was built in the shape of a rectangle running north-south along the western bank of the Tonle Sap River, which flowed into the much longer uh, Mekong River at that point. Lots of the public buildings, such as the post office, library, railroad station, resembled buildings in France. So did the tree-lined avenues radiating from the public gardens to the north and the shaded promenades along the river. Unlike the Cambodian countryside, which was almost exclusively populated by Khmer people, the capital city was ethnically mixed. In 1936, roughly half of its population of 100,000 people were immigrant Chinese and Vietnamese, and these people dominated the commercial sector of town. 45,000 Cambodians lived around the palace as monks and monasteries or as bureaucrats, farmers, artisans, petty traders in the southern and western sectors of the city. Many of them were poor and not as prosperous as the Chinese and Vietnamese living there. At the western edge of the city, the Cambodians' bamboo and wooden houses raised on stilts, surrounded by mango and banana trees, with domestic animals roaming underneath, were indistinguishable from rural dwellings. Good old sheds on sticks. Living that jungle shed life. I uh, can only imagine how hot it was inside these uh, sheds in that human jungle climate. I think I said banana. Let's, let's go with mango trees. I'm, it's in my notes, but I'm questioning. I don't, I don't, now, now I'm thinking I don't think there is banana trees. Maybe there is, but scratch that from the record. Mango trees. Uh, yeah, can only imagine how hot it was inside those sheds, though, in that humid jungle climate. A lot of sweaty butt cracks back then. Unless you were royalty, your butt crack probably was literally always sweaty from birth to death, just beads of sweat running down your butt valley. At the northern edge of the city, the small hill, uh, Nam Pen, or Nam, excuse me, that gave the city its name, Nam Pen, uh, means the Hill of the Lady Pen. The hill was crowned by 17th century monastery, several Buddhist uh, reliqui reliquaries. The area had been landscaped by the French into a 25-acre park with a small zoo, floral clock, some, you know, uh, statues, bandstands, several outdoor cafes. It was really pretty. It was beautiful. It sounds lovely. You know, later on, Paul, Pol Pot would fucking ruin all this. Uh, roughly half a mile south of Nam, facing the river, was the Royal Palace, whose main buildings had been designed by French architects in a Thai-Cambodian style in the early 1900s. Set back from the foreshore behind manicured lawns, the white and cream buildings with their green adornage tiled roofs glittering in the sun resembled the Buddhist temples scattered throughout the city. Give a passerby a glimpse of resplendent, ethereal wealth. Must have been a cool place for Pol Pot to grow up, especially since he was, you know, uh, you know, connected to the royalty. 
Beginning when Pol Pot was in elementary school, the first stirrings of nationalism in Cambodia had started to arise. Three young Cambodians affiliated with the Buddhist Institute in Phnom Penh received permission from the French to publish a Khmer language newspaper, Angkor Wat, the first of its kind in Cambodian history. Angkor Wat reported the activities of Cambodia's elite, reprinted the texts of regulations and decrees, and in editorials urged Cambodians to awaken, to catch up with the Chinese and Vietnamese who dominated commercial life. Come on, right? Let's have some pride. It's a, why, why, why are they doing better than us kind of thing? Uh, the paper had a circulation of over 5,000 copies as weekly readership, particularly among Buddhist monks who passed copies from hand to hand, probably much higher. So Salas is born during a period when Cambodians are wanting to regain their cultural identity and autonomy, which sounds familiar to me. Uh, sounds like Germany in the 19th century. Uh-oh, people who feel like they got something to prove. 1941, when Salas was around 16, he finally completes his primary studies. Uh, initially, he fails his entrance exams for high school. Again, he's not a good student. Following the year 1942, 20 boys from various Cambodian provinces are selected as the first class to attend a new school, the College Nordom uh, uh, man, uh, Swanuk, which was a really good, uh, which was really a high school. All of them were to be boarders. Salah Star, chosen as part of the contingent from Kampong Tom. Ironically, in view of the past they followed later, Salah Star's closest friend at the school was Lan Nan, an official son from Kampong Tom. Lan Nan's uh, oldest brother, Lan Nol, would later become president of the Khmer Republic in 1970, get his ass kicked by Pol's uh, Com Cambodian communists. Clearly, even though he was not a good student, he was, he was uh, you know, going to a good school, sharing classes with the Cambodian upper crust. In 1945, France was invaded by Nazi Germany and the French briefly lost control of Cambodia. A German ally, Japan, kicked the French the fuck out of Cambodia. Cambodian King Swanok, uh, Swanuk, uh, proclaimed independence. I'm gonna get his name right later. I don't have the pronunciation guide on this one, but. Stay, stay tuned on that name. I'll, I'll, I'll nail it in the second half. Um, he proclaimed independence for his country, but then the very next year, the French were back. Damn it. The French would rule differently now, allowing for a Cambodian constitution, the establishment of various political parties, and democratic elections. Salas was witnessing a lot of political change as he came into his independence as a young adult. Man, I'm sure he was having all kinds of discussions about what type of government was the best kind. Was it okay to be a protectorate of France? Should they be independent of France? Should they be a monarchy? A capitalist democracy? Should they be communists? 1947, Pol Pot leaves the College of uh, Swanuk in, uh, uh, this year and graduates high school. Uh, if his 1925 birthday is to be believed, he graduates a wee bit late at 22 years old. So let's, let's, let's put that guy in charge. If anything screams future leaders graduating high school at 22 years old. 1948, he does not pass an exam uh, that you're supposed to pass to go on to a liberal arts college in the French educational system of Cambodia. So his academic studies come to an end in a certain way, right? Again, put him in charge. He can't get into literally any college. Uh, sure, he's been held back in school numerous times, you know. But why? Because he was born to lead. What could go wrong? Take the kid consistently not paying attention. Doodle in the back of the class and put that fucker in charge. Uh, Paul took exams to be enrolled in a vocational school now, which was his other option. And he becomes a carpentry student at Ecole Technique. Uh, located in a nor northern suburb of Phnom Penh. Salah Star, sent at this uh, school, places him for the first time in consistent contact with less privileged young people, most of whom who had had little contact with the French or other members of the country's traditional elite. So he's, he's, around, he's around the peasants now for the first time in his adult life. Really the first time in his life. I mean, yeah, he was born in that little fishing village, but as a young child, he went to Phnom Penh. It was around royalty. So now he's having to get his hands dirty for the first time, stepping down from his French education and his palace connections. Uh, late 1948, he applies for another technical school, this time in Paris, France. He's among 77 uh, students in the protectorate who, who took entrance examinations for this school. He does pass this one. It is a technical school. A year later, 1949, he's among the first 100 men and women sent to France with government trade school scholarships. His royal family contacts uh, undoubtedly probably helped him you know, get this going. It's not like his kick-ass academic abilities were pushing him along. Before heading to France, he meets Leng Sari, another vocational student. The two would spend time together in Paris where they would become members of the French Communist Party. They would end up marrying sisters, returning to Cambodia in 1957, where they would become communist militants in Phnom Penh. With a handful of other close associates, they will later guide the Cambodian Revolution and the affairs of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, CPK. 1949, Salat heads to Paris to study o to study radio electronics on a scholarship. He starts off in Paris, uh, as many Cambodian students did, by taking a room in an Indo-Chinese pavilion, 
complex of dormitories for French and foreign students on the southern edge of the city. Pol Pot later recalled in 1978, in the first year, I worked rather hard. I was a fairly good student. He was a fairly good student, you guys. Put him in charge. He only got held back a few times, graduated high school four years later or something. Didn't, didn't get accepted into college, and uh, he was a fairly good student at a trade school. F- fit to lead. Come on. Aside from a, a few short holidays, he spent more than three years in Paris. We know that he enrolled for courses connected with radio electricity. We know he met other young Cambodian youth all fired up to become communists and overthrow their colonial masters. Uh, we know he lived in Paris, yeah, from 1949 to 1952. We don't know everything he did. Uh, we do know that he returned to Cambodia in 1952 without ever getting his radio uh, electronics degree. Again, killing the game. Before he came back home, we also know in 1950, he spent a, uh, a summer volunteering in Yugoslavia. Uh, the details are a little fuzzy about what he did. No one knows exactly what he was doing as a volunteer. Uh, it seems as if he worked for a month as a manual laborer in the communist country at an exciting stage of its development. The regime was led by the World War II resistance hero, Josip Braz Tito, gave Pot an intimate view of what a communist leader looked like. Tito seen by most as having been a pretty benevolent dictator. He was a popular public figure, both in Yugoslavia and abroad. He was beloved. Uh, he, you know, he may have given Salah a false sense of how cool and how good it could be to be a communist leader. He deserves his own suck, but basically he saved his people from other dictators more ruthless than him. Don't go thinking he's a shining example of how awesome communism is. He was still ruthless, just not a total shitbird. Salath also took an interest in the writings of Karl Marx around this time. when He was uh, over in uh, France and Yugoslavia. Speaking of reading, uh, Pol Pot told journalist Nate Thayer in 1997 during one of his final interviews, I looked for secondhand books that were on sale along the sign, the old books that I love to read. When I got money for my scholarship, I had to spend it on rent and food. So I only had 20 or 25 francs to spend, but I got a lot of books to read. He must have also absorbed a, a good deal of French literature because when shortly, or, you know, I guess the, out of those books, a lot of it was French literature because when he, when he returned to Cambodia and he became a teacher in Phnom Penh later, he knew enough 19th century French poetry by heart to impress, you know, to regale his Cambodian students. One of his favorite authors was the 18th century French philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Uh, the beliefs of Jean-Jacques Rousseau influenced Salah greatly. Jean-Jacques was a philosopher that believed, as laid out in his work, The Social Contract, that people were better off living a primitive lifestyle, and that before society began to modernize and industrialize, people were more moral, they were happier, everything was better. I'm guessing previous suck subject Ted Unabomber Kaczynski, also a big fan of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, based on his opposition to technology. God damn it, Jean-Jacques! You push Ted out into the Montana fucking cabin to write his manifesto and you push Pol Pot towards a terrible agrarian simple living experiment that led to millions of deaths and absolutely nothing good. Right? Simple. Fuck. fuck, ah, People want to go back in time. All right. If you you want to, just like I said, the Ted Kaczynski suck. All right. If if you want simple living, fine. But don't make the rest of us try and subscribe to it. 1951, uh, probably 26-year-old Sloth, uh, met his wife, Q Panari, who had come to France with her younger sister, Q. Thirith. Uh, uh, Paneri came to study Khmer linguistics. Thirith came to study English literature. Sounds like one of those ladies should have returned to lead Cambodia. Not a communist, uh, you know, obsessed, far below average student. In 1952, Salas uh, has his political musings published for the first time. He writes an eight-page essay titled Monarchy or Democracy. And he has it published in a special issue of Khmer Students Magazine, uh, Khmer Nusut, under the pseudonym Khmer Daum, meaning the original Khmer. And I realize, if, yeah, if you actually happen to speak Cambodian, I'm sure you're like, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I didn't get a, I didn't get a degree in uh, Cambodia uh, this past week. I <laughs> speak fluently. Some of these words, much easier to find pronunciation guides for than others. Uh, Pol Pot's handwritten article accusing uh, Sanuk of, of being an absolute monarch and defined monarchy as a doctrine which bestows power on a small group of men who do nothing to earn their living so that they can exploit the majority of the people at every level. Monarchy is is an unjust doctrine, a malodorous running sore that people must eliminate. So didn't like the monarchy. Okay, interesting that the guy who benefited numerous times from royal connections so anti-monarchy now. I don't think he's wrong. I'm not into monarchies either. Just interesting for him to essentially be biting the hand that has fed him there. Uh, February 12th, 1952, Grammy winner Michael motherfucking McDonald was born in St. Louis, Missouri. What a fool believes he sees the wise man has a power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Now I'm back. Now I'm back. Didn't expect that, did you? A little, little vicious McDonald's he snuck in there. Okay, now, now we're back to Cambodia. When Salah <laughs> returned to Cambodia, January 1953, after flunking out of trade school and losing his government scholarship, he stays for a while with his brother Loth Swong in Phnom Penh. His brother notices that Sar is becoming very interested in politics. I think about the people, Sar told him. Uh, he also praised Russia. He bragged about Russia and talked about working on Yugoslavia. Oh, man, those, those commies really did a propaganda number on him when he was in uh, France and Yugoslavia. Stalin's gulags, you know, they were still in effect in the early 50s. It hadn't been that long since Stalin killed millions of Ukrainians with his man-made famine. What the fuck was so impressive about Russia? What did he see there that was so great? Fucking, so he was a fucking shithole in the 50s. Uh, politics was on everyone's minds in Cambodia in January 1953. Uh, that month, the Cambodian king, Norodom Swanak, uh, dissolved the National Assembly, declared martial law and freedom from the French. The French did not, did not fight Cambodian independence, and the nation returned briefly to become a monarchy, a constitutional monarchy to be uh, specific. Less than a month later, Salath leaves Swang's house, his brother's house, to join the resistance. He travels to the capital, makes contact with a man named Pham Van Ba, the local representative of the Indochina Communist Party, and he asked to be inducted into the Communist Party. Uh, ba then inducts Sar into the ICP, leapfrogging the Khmer People's Revolutionary Party. Salath travels to rural eastern Cambodia, which he reaches in August of 1953. At first, he uh, joins forces, uh, you know, uh, joins up with forces who are allied to the Viet Minh. Communist Vietnamese forces operate in the rural areas of Kampong Cham province. Forces that would push the French out of Vietnam beginning in 1954. After fighting with Viet Minh, Salath moves back to uh, Phnom Penh to be part of a communist urban committee. There was the urban committee and the rural committee. Underground networks around Cambodia are, you know, are preparing for eventual revolution. They're having to work in secret. Salath becomes an important point of contact between above-ground communist or communist-leaning political parties and the underground secret communist revolutionary movement. From his Vietnamese-trained mentors, he learns about party discipline, organization, more communist theory, uh, as well as the importance of being clandestine and being concealed. Salath and his fellow conspirators would work largely from the shadows for a long time to get things ready for the revolution. Salath Sar is now, you know, he's beginning to morph into this uh, Pol Pot character. He starts to develop his own political aspirations. He, along with a group of Cambodian leftists, began to plot a new kind of Cambodian independence, independence from the monarchy, independence from the U.S., who you know, quickly swooped in after Cambodia broke off its relationship with France. Uh, the U.S. was worried about Cambodia falling into communist hands, so they began to supply Cambodia's new government with military aid. In the 1950s, Cambodia adopted an official position of neutrality in the Cold War. The monarchy didn't want to get in bed with the communists or the capitalists, so of course the CIA showed up. Uh, since America at this time, terribly concerned about the communist domino theory, right? Afraid that Russia and or China is going to turn all of Southeast Asia into communist satellite states, which, which was a valid fear. Pol Pot has no interest in this happening to Cambodia. He doesn't want, you know, to always be tied to China or to Russia or, or Vietnam, especially not Vietnam. He's working with them in the moment, but, but he, you know, not, he doesn't want to be aligned with them later. He wants to have his own independent communist goals in Cambodia. He wants Cambodia to be an independent communist nation not another colony. You know, they just moved away from foreign rule. He doesn't want to move back in that direction, even if that direction is communist. Vietnamese communist guidance begins to grate on Pol Pot and his colleagues with the Vietnamese treating them not as fellow revolutionaries, but as younger brothers in the buildup to their all-absorbing war against the U.S. 1956, Salas marries his wife, Q Pan uh, Panari, uh, Q uh, described as being small, neat, even elegant in a simple, natural way. Prior to her marriage, she wore no jewelry or makeup. She cut her hair in an old-fashioned Chinese style, it said. She preferred somber clothes. She sounds super fun. Uh, many Cambodians found her hard to fathom. They called her the old virgin behind her back. So not exactly kicking out a Lucifina-type energy. More of a, I'm, I'm going to lay my back and quietly hope for a child type of sexual energy. A uh, student of Q's in 1956 later recalled that in the moments or the months before her marriage to Salath, the old virgin began to wear lipstick and a little jewelry. For a time, she seemed warmer and more accessible. She said she seemed so happy. We were happy on her behalf. Right about this time, still in 1956, Salath embarks on a career teaching French history, geography, and civics in a newly established private college in Phnom Penh. The terrible student becomes a teacher. So now he appears to be living a pretty normal life and, you know, appears to be pretty successful. He's married. They seem happy. He's a teacher. Things are going, you know, well. Their country's independence. But then, you know, behind the scenes, he's plotting his revolution. To, to make the country be what he wants it to be, which turned out to be a terrible vision. 
Sometime after his marriage, 1956, 1957, he cuts himself off from relatives who've helped raise him, cuts himself off from the royals. He's changing. He has to shed his old skin to become something new. He'd see most of his relatives for the last time in 1959 when he attends his father's funeral, and then he disappears. Dedicates himself to working towards Cambodian communism. He helps form a network of future militants, gather, gathering and mobilizing Cambodia's proletariat, which includes railway workers and longshoresmen and you know the, the farmers. The Cambodian communists insist that the proletariat will make up the vanguard of the revolution. After a party leader disappears in 1957 or 1958, Pol Pot becomes the acting secretary, the leader of the party central committee. He's leading two separate lives, right? He's Salah Sar, the school teacher still during the day, Pol Pot, the revolutionary at night. It's like he was Bruce Wayne and Batman. If Bruce Wayne was a school teacher and Batman fucking sucked. Uh, he began to give occasional seminars on civic virtue, justice, and corruption that were attended by monks, students, military men, and bureaucrats. He continues to teach. Unlike Stalin, who based his identity on being a big, tough military dude, Pol uh, Pot's authority came from being a respected teacher. Despite all the shit I've given him about being a terrible student, he apparently was a charismatic teacher. Running a classroom, let him practice giving his speeches, let him work on his rhetoric. Yeah, he tells students stuff like how unjust, uh, unjust it is uh, for the government to charge Cambodians fees when they're born, when they get married, and even when they die. No one can do anything, he says, unless the government gets its fee. He suggests that the government is rotten and leading the people into deeper poverty. He speaks of a new society where fees will not be paid because everyone will be working and sharing the fruits of their collective labor together. And his students listen. In 1963, some high school students revolt and carry banners saying that the monarchy is corrupt and ineffective. The king demands a list now of communist organizers in Cambodia. Pol Pot is on that list. We know from government records that he was their party secretary. After being put on a list of rabble-rousers, you know, the top dog on the list, he decides to bounce. Leave the city before he's thrown in jail and locked up. He and some fellow revolutionaries take refuge in the eastern part of the country, hiding out in the jungle. He joins up with former Khmer uh, militants in northern Kampong Cham. In his own words, talking to Yugoslavian journalists in 1978, Pol Pot said, in 1963, I could not stay anymore in Phnom Penh. I was not very well known to the public, but Lan Nal's police followed my activities. They knew me, but they did not know exactly who I was. In Phnom Penh, I was the general responsible for movement in the capital. I was also in charge of liaison with the countryside. 1963, a big year for Salah Sar. It was the year Salah fully completed his metamorphosis to become a revolutionary. He abandoned the double life he'd been leading since 1953. No longer restrained now by his career. He's no longer a teacher. No longer restrained by family connections. He just takes off, does his own thing. You know, it's fucking see wife. I'm going to go be in the jungle doing my shit. Uh, good luck with whatever you want to do. Uh, as a revolutionary now, he, he's officially on the run, hiding in camps in northern and northeastern Cambodia, traveling back and forth between Cambodia and Vietnam, depending on the safety of the camps. Spending time in Vietnamese camps firmly cements his already existing desire to break away from Vietnamese communists. He doesn't like the way they treat him. Pol Pot secretly visits communist China in 1965. He stays there until 1966. He's loving what Mao Zedong is doing up there. Big fan. Inspired by the dude who just pulled off that disgusting great leap forward, that big old giant kick in the dick that led to the deaths of somewhere between 15 and 80 million people. Another nice role model. He's like, yeah, fuck, that's great. First Stalin, then Mao. Fuck yeah, awesome. Clearly Pol Pot, not afraid to sacrifice a lot of lives to achieve his vision. During Pol Pot's absence in Cambodia, the Vietnam War is escalating. It's escalating back in Vietnam, spilling into Cambodia. By the end of 1965, some 300,000 U.S. combat and support troops had poured into South Vietnam. More were on the way. U.S. and South Vietnamese infantry attacks on uh, Vietnamese communist forces were accompanied by intense aerial bombardment. Some of the fighting spilling across the border into Cambodia. Not officially, but it was. Pol Pot wants to return home. The time now was, it was almost right to overthrow the Cambodian government, bring his shattery regime into the light, or at least he had to be there for the preparation. Now let's pop out of this Pol Pot timeline uh, then we'll jump into the history of the Khmer Rouge timeline in just a bit that will reconnect with Pol Pot's ascent. Uh, so that'll, that'll be in just a, just a moment. Good job, soldier. You made it back. Barely. Now, before I go further, I've thrown a lot of info out. I think we need to do a little recap. And, uh, and also, I I'd like you, if you're not watching the video version, to, to please listen to a brief word from a few awesome sponsors slanging some sweet-ass deals your way. Hail Nimrod for sponsorship. Never thought as a kid I'd end up getting sponsored by anything. That was just something cool, you know, pro skateboarders or NASCAR drivers got. 
and I couldn't skate for shit, and driving a Hyundai didn't exactly prepare me for the racetrack. Somehow worked out for this silly nerd. Life, life is funny sometimes. Okay, so brief recap on what we've gone over so far. Pol Pot was not originally Pol Pot, right? He was, he was born into a small fishing village, born into a family that was doing far better than the average peasant, born into a family connected to Cambodian royalty, and then he was raised around royalty in the capital city of Phnom Penh. He was given the best educational opportunities Cambodia had to offer. Uh, he was unable to take advantage of all those opportunities because he was not a good student. Why wasn't he good? We don't know. We don't know if he had limited intellectual uh, abilities or if he just didn't pay attention. Uh, I will, I'm going to demonstrate going forward that I, I do think he was kind of a fucking dummy, um, uh, which worked out terribly for Cambodia. Uh, you know, he ended up getting to study in Paris where he continued to not do well in school, but he did really get into communism at a time when Cambodia was transitioning from being a protectorate of France, returning to a monarchy. The Cold War was happening all around him at this time. In 1954, after a long war against France, the first Indochina War, North Vietnam had become a communist nation. Laos became a communist nation in 1953. China had become a communist nation back in 1949. Thailand had allied itself with the United States. A large contingent of communists were fighting for control of Burma. The Southeast Asian Peninsula was very much caught up in the Cold War. So much of Asia was. North Korea became a communist nation following World War II at the end of 1945. It was becoming impossible for Cambodia to not pick a side. You had to align yourself, at least somewhat, with a pro-communist nation or a pro-capitalist nation. There was no third option. Pol Pot would push Cambodia into communism with horrible results. So let's explore that push now while also learning more about the history of Cambodia as we launch into our second Time Suck timeline. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a Time Suck timeline. Let's go way back for this one. Let's start somewhere between 11,700 and 2.5 million years ago. There's some evidence for Ice Age human occupation of present-day Cambodia, which includes quartz and quartzite pebble tools found in terraces along the Mekong River, in Stung Treng, in the uh, Krati provinces, and in Kampot province, although their dating is unreliable. So great crystals. Please don't tell my wife, Lindsay. She'll convince herself that these early Cambodians were fucking wizards or something. Uh, by 6,000 BCE, there were for sure ancient people living somewhere, uh, you know, living where present day, excuse me, Cambodia is. Signs of early humans found in the cave in the Batambang province. The first rice farmers migrated down into Cambodia from the north, beginning in the late third millennium BCE. In the second millennium BC, iron beginning to be worked with in Cambodia. Some Iron Age settlements found dating back to roughly 4,000 years ago. Burials from this time testify to the improvement of food availability and trade. By the 4th century BC, trade relations with India had been well established. Different kinds of glass beads show that there were several active trading networks. Uh, excuse me. During the 3rd, 4th, and 5th centuries CE, the Indianized states of Funan and its successor, Chen La, coalesced in present-day Cambodia and southwestern Vietnam. For more than 2,000 years, what was to become Cambodia absorbed influences from India, passed them on to other Southeast Asian nations or civilizations like Thailand and Laos. Cambodia was a nexus between Indian culture and Southwest, uh, you know, Asian culture, a link between different traditions. Um, Cambodia was a nexus between, excuse me, Indian culture and Southeast Asian culture. And, uh, in 802 CE, the Khmer Empire grew out of the remnants of Chen La when King uh, Jay Jayavarman II declared independence and proclaimed himself a godlike monarch. He and his followers instituted the cult of the God King and began a series of conquests that formed an empire which flourished in the area from the 9th to the 15th centuries. He presented himself, as did many of his descendants, as a living God. Sweet! That is about the most devotion a human can achieve here on Earth, to become a God King. I would be a terrible God King. I'm too moody. And I like to be left alone too much. And I'd probably become pretty corrupt if I got to do whatever I wanted and no one could question me because I was God. I mean, who wouldn't become corrupt in that situation? God is hangry, so everyone needs to leave God the fuck alone until God's done eating his sandwich. And then God's going to probably take a nap for a bit. So keep, keep leaving God alone. God's sick of your questions. God's sick of your prayers. Well, help me. I'm starving. My kid's sick. I got gimpy legs. God's sick of it. Every day after my nap, God's probably going to want to spend some time with his, with his consort, with his harem in private. And then I'm a, God's going to need to eat again. And God's going to want to chill out in the pool and probably sleep some more. So, so basically just, just stay the fuck away from God. 
Or God's going to have you killed, okay? All right? Just leave your tributes at the palace gates and fucking beat it, you dirty peasants. By the 12th century, uh, the royal Khmer God King Empire had become Southeast Asia's largest empire. The empire's center of power was anger, uh, where a series of capitals were constructed during the empire's zenith. We talked about that earlier. Uh, around the 13th century, monks from Sri Lanka introduced Buddhism to Southeast Asia. Uh, Buddhism spread and eventually displaced Hinduism as the popular religion. And just like that, no more God kings, just regular old shitty kings. 1432, Angor was sacked by the uh, Ayutthaya kingdom that had risen out of Thailand. Shortly after sacking Angor, the city was abandoned because of ecological failure and infrastructure breakdown, which led to a long period of social, economic, and cultural stagnation. Cue the Cambodian Dark Ages, over 400 years of continually shifting leadership and the land of Cambodia being ruled by a variety of other nations. For most of this Dark Age period, Cambodia was under the thumb of either the Vietnamese or the Siamese. And by Siamese, I don't mean that they were ruled by a bunch of conjoined identical twins. Uh, No, not that Siamese, although that would be super awesome for storytelling purposes. Now, Siamese in this context means from Siam, which is what Thailand used to be called. Uh, And and, and why were conjoined twins, uh, by the way, twins whose bodies uh, fused together in some way, who generally share certain organs or in some cases share an entire body, why were they called Siamese twins? Let's take take an interesting little detour, okay, just for funsies. Because I got into a weird wormhole and I want to share this with you. Uh, Siamese twins uh, that comes from uh, the first internationally known conjoined twins were from Siam. They were Thai, right? Uh, Chang and Ang Bunker, born in 1811, lived until they were 62 years old, permanently connected to the sternum for 62 years, right? From the middle of the chest, they were connected by a flexible circular band of flesh and cartilage about five inches long. Right, they were they were five inches away from being like chest bumping for sixty two years. Tragically, had they been born today, they could have been easily been surgically separated. Uh, and I know again, this has fucking nothing to do with Pol Pot, but I just want to tell you this story. Just a quick little like suck within a suck because this shit is crazy. At the age of eighteen, uh, these twins moved to the U.S., toured in a freak show for about a decade, made a shitload of money, held on to that money, then settled down near Mount Airy, North Carolina. They became slave owners. They got married. Each of them got married. Their wives were sisters, fathered 21 children between the two of them. Their families lived in separate houses, and these guys would take turns living in each house. They spent a few days in one house, so one dude could be with his wife. (laughs) Spent a few days in the next house, so that guy could be with his wife. Today, they have over 1,500 descendants, most of whom still live in North Carolina. Man, what strange lives they led. Think about fathering those kids. When one of the brothers was having sex with his wife, the other brother was right there. You know, because of the way their sternums were connected, he couldn't even turn away. His dick was no more than like, what? Fucking three feet from his other brother's dick at all times. Each brother for sure heard the other brother having sex. And unless they kept their eyes closed each and every time, they watched. Did they join in? I don't know. Maybe reach over for an ass slap from time to time. Sneaking a little help. Or, or did one brother like lay on the bed and maybe had a blanket thrown over him while his other brother, you know, got busy? What, what about masturbation? My mind goes to so many weird places. Like, what, what about taking a shit? One brother would have to sit in a chair or, or not even that because of the way that they were connected. He would kind of have to face his brother, kind of lean down so the one brother could take a shit and he would just be like fucking looking right at his brother's face. Jesus Christ, what a weird existence. Uh, good for them for uh, carving regular lives out for themselves. I guess they never knew any different. I, I'd go mad, never be able to get away from somebody. Uh, weird ending. They didn't die at the exact same time. One brother died in his sleep. The other brother woke up, talked to some other family members. His dead brother's connected to him. And he died a few hours later. I'm sure because of some weird situation where, you know, because the tissue's going back and forth. Oh, my, my, just blew my mind going in that little side road for a second. We got to do a suck someday on conjoined twins. Can we? I, I find it so fascinating. Just, just a weird concept to be connected to somebody, to share part of your body with somebody for your whole life. Okay, back to the Cambodian Dark Ages. All right, all right. For around 400 years, Cambodia was under the uh, the thumb, as I said earlier, of either the Vietnamese or the Siamese. In the 19th century, struggle between Siam and Vietnam for control of Cambodia resulted in a period uh, when Vietnamese officials attempted to force the Khmer to adopt Vietnamese customs. This led to several rebellions against the Vietnamese beginning in 1841. They would appeal to, uh, Cambodia would, to uh, appeal to Thailand for assistance. 
Um, the, uh, the Siamese Vietnamese, you know, war, the Thai Vietnamese war kicked off, ended in 1845 with an agreement to place the country, the country under basically joint custody. That's real weird. That's pretty rare, right? Uh, for one nation to be overseen by two separate countries who don't even really get along. Right? Like, like a, like a, like the weird fucking nation kid of divorced nation parents, Right, Cambodia's with Vietnam Vietnam during the week. You know, Vietnam's making sure that Cambodia's doing its homework, eating three square ma- meals a day, going to bed on time. And then weekend dad, Siam, shows up and fucks everything up. Siam lets Cambodia stay up way too late. Let's Cambodia have pop tarts for breakfast and dinner, hot dogs, potato chips, and Mountain Dew for lunch. Siam lets Cambodia watch R-rated movies, ride his bike around without a helmet. Come on, Siam! You're making Vietnam look like an asshole. All she's doing is trying to make sure Cambodia has all the tools that he needs to become a successful grown-up country someday. 1863, the Thai king Nordum uh, decides he needs protection. The Siamese and the Vietnamese are going to keep fighting over Cambodia, and Cambodia is going to keep asking them for help. So he reaches out to France. By 1867, the Thai king has signed a treaty with France and renounced its custody of Cambodia. You know, fucking you have him. Weekend dad's out. In exchange for control of some other provinces. Uh, custody of Cambodia is now officially given to France. Now, Vietnam relinquishes it. Cambodia is uh, going to be a protectorate colony of France from 1867 to 1953 now, part of French Indochina. Although it was occupied by the Japanese Empire just for a bit, just for a little, little, little wee bit during World War II, which we already went over. Uh, why did France want land, all this land in Southeast Asia? Well, money. It's always about money. High taxes on the local consumption of goods like salt, opium, and rice alcohol filled the coffers of the French colonial government. I think we talked about this in the Vietnam side. Right? Just those three items comprised 44% of the government's budget by 1920. The French then began in the 1930s to exploit the area's natural resources. What is now Vietnam became a rich source of zinc, tin, and coal, as well as cash crops such as rice, rubber, coffee, and tea. Cambodia supplied pepper, rubber, and rice. The availability of plentiful, high-quality rubber led to the establishment of famous French tire companies such as Michelin. This whole time during the Dark Ages, during the French protectorate period, Cambodia continues to have its own royal family. They don't always get to lead, but the lineage continues. They get to, you know, sit in on little thrones and fucking wave scepters from time to time. 1941, uh, the Japanese Empire invades French Indochina, takes over for a bit. Their occupation ends in 1945. 1946, following the Second World War, France expects the other allied powers to return its Indochinese colonies to its control but the people of Indochina have different ideas. They expected to be granted independence after the war, and this difference of opinion leads to the first Indochina war and eventually leads to the Vietnam conflict. France reimposes its protectorate in 1946 on Cambodia. As I touched on earlier, a new constitution permits Cambodians to form political parties. This includes communist parties. The decision comes back to haunt the French. Communist guerrillas begin an armed campaign against their French occupiers and overlords. 1950, Cambodian communists joined forces with Vietnamese communists against French colonialism. In 1953, as I touched on earlier as well, Cambodia wins its independence from France. Most Cambodians are super happy. Not all are. When French Indochina is given independence, Cambodia loses hope of regaining control over the Mekong Delta as that land is awarded to Vietnam. It was disputed. Formerly part of the Khmer Empire, that delta had been controlled by the Vietnamese since 1698. But tens of thousands of ethnic Khmer still lived in the area. Cue tension between the Cambodians and the Vietnamese that still exists to this day. In 1954, Vietnamese communists under Ho Chi Minh defeat the French. And the French give up their claims to the former protectorate of French Indochina. The U.S., fearing that Ho Chi Minh will add Vietnam to the communist bloc, enters the war that the French abandoned, giving us the beginning, the very beginning of the French, or of the Vietnam, excuse me, conflict. As I also mentioned earlier, As the Vietnam conflict intensifies in the late 50s and the early 60s, Cambodia tries to stay the hell out of it, maintain a position of neutrality, but they can't stay out of it. You don't get to stay out of the Cold War when you're in a place like Cambodia. The Cambodians allow Vietnamese communists, they make some concessions, to use Cambodia as a sanctuary and as a supply route for their arms and other aid to their armed forces fighting in South Vietnam. The U.S. doesn't like this. And this policy was perceived as uh, being humiliating by many Cambodians, right? Just more kowtowing to Vietnam. And of course, it leads to fighting on Cambodian soil. So while the Cambodians aren't officially part of the Vietnam conflict, they really kind of are. In July of 1962, Cambodian communist leader Tao Samoth disappears. Most think he was caught and murdered by the Cambodian government. Pol Pot takes his place. 
right? Making plans for rebellion. We touched on this earlier as well. 1967, Pol Pot's still waiting to make his big move in Cambodia. His Communist Party changed its name in 1967 from the Revolutionary Workers' Party to the Communist Party of Kampuchea, the ethnic name of Cambodia. He wants to make it sound like they're just earthy, rootsy people. They just want to get back to the way it was, man. Let's make Kampuchea, Camp- let's make Kampuchea great again, right? This, this kind of thing. They moved a, a lot of key personnel, including Pol Pot, to the rural northeastern province of Ratakiri. Uh, Ratanakiri, I think. that I could not find uh, somebody who wasn't a lunatic uh, saying that word correctly. <laughs> Joe and I watched a video right before this recording where some American tourist was over there, oh my God, doing the most heinous, over-the-top like parody of a Cambodian accent. And he was saying that word, and yeah, I don't trust his. I don't trust the way he was doing it. You're going to make me sound like a real asshole. Uh, so th- th- anyway, they move a lot of key personnel, including Pol Pot, to this rural northeastern province. The move was probably made to avoid U.S. bombing raids. Several party leaders, including Pol Pot, shifted from rural Cambodia, uh, where they worked amongst uh, Buddhist Khmer peasants into a sparsely inhabited world of tribal minorities who spoke different dialects and engaged in slash and burn kind of primitive agriculture. And this exposure, exposure to this, affects Pol Pot's communist philosophy greatly. In Marxian communist terms, these tribes people had great ideological significance for him. Without access to money, markets, or the state, they enjoyed what appeared to be deeply rooted traditions of autonomy, solidarity, and mutual aid. In Pol Pot's eyes, these people were participating in primitive communism. They seemed like noble savages to him, uncorrupted by social differentiation or money. They were, in Maoist terms, poor and blank receptacles for communist teaching. This combination made them role models for the urban intellectuals who dominated the upper reaches of the Cambodian communist movement. Pol Pot finally has a very concrete idea, a very clear vision of how he wants his country to look. As Cambodia heads for civil war, torn between U.S. promises to maintain its constitutional monarchy and those who want to turn the nation into a communist country, the communists are plenty busy. Like in any civil war, there's a lot of different factions, students protesting the monarchy, Republicans, professional soldiers, monarchists, Vietnam uh, opportunists. You know, the list goes on and on. The communists are trying to recruit anyone they can to their side of the conflict. They're fighting the monarchy and nationalist general and politician Lan Nol, a man who hates communism, who becomes prime minister of Cambodia in the 1966 elections. Despite Lan Nol's victory, not everyone is on board with the monarchy and with being allied with the United States. There's a war of propaganda going on between the nationalists, the Republicans, and the, and the communists. And who is usually ready to revolt when there is talk of civil war? Who historically is ready to fight the establishment? The poor and the downtrodden. Of course they are. The current system doesn't seem to be working for them. So they, you know, they feel like they have little to lose, possibly much to gain by trying to overthrow it. This would horribly backfire on them. Uh, they were they were poor and ah, they, they didn't think life could get worse. And it turns out it would, it would get a lot worse. In April of 1967, impoverished peasants revolt in western Badamang, or Badabang, uh, near the village of Samulat. Over 200 local people, some bearing anti-American banners, attack Cambodian army posts. Violence spreads into neighboring villages over the next few days. The army's response is swift. Hundreds of suspects are rounded up, beaten, and interrogated. Hundreds of others flee their homes and take refuge in the forests. And then army units storm through the village, seeking the victims, scapegoats, and loot. Who benefits from all of this? Pol Pot and the Communist Party of Kampuchea. This helps CPK recruiting immensely. The CPK also, because now the government looks like a big bully. Uh, the CPK now begins to launch their own guerrilla strikes against the Cambodian army. Great deal of combat occurs around Vai Chap M- Mountain, a former guerrilla hideout that had recently been reoccupied by radicals fleeing from Lan Nol. The rebels were pursued into the forest by hundreds of local people who had been given staves and hatchets, formed into you know militia units, told to chase the Reds and kill those fucking commies. Rewards are given for delivering seven heads, severed heads, back to authorities. More than 1,000 communist sympathizers die. Shit like this often gets lost in the telling of the Khmer Rouge story. What the communists would do in the coming years would be you know, far more brutal. But the moderate constitutional monarchists, the Republicans, the anti-communists, they were no saints either. Fighting the army for more than two months in 1967 weakens the communists greatly. It was a huge drain on their limited resources. In a speech given a decade later in September 1977, Pol Pot declared that in 1967, the enemy was wavering and incapable of facing the revolutionary forces. But in fact, the reverse was true. You know, they weren't capable of, of fighting the, uh, you know, the, the, the nationalists, the Republicans. While the Red Khmer 
were struggling to stay afloat, reeling from attacks on Lan Nal's army. Their principal opponent, uh, Naradam uh, Sihanouk, was way less secure than he'd ever been. While Lan Nal was technically in charge of Cambodia, uh, Naradam Sihanouk, that's the word I was looking for earlier, former king of Cambodia, was the real leader, running the show from a shadow government behind the public elected government. The Cambodian government at the time was complicated, to say the least. Uh, armed resistance from more and more peasants led to uh, Sihanouk using more and more military repression to quell the uprisings, which pushed more people to revolt. It was a nasty cycle. Then in the middle of 1969, Sihanouk openly accepts diplomatic relations with the United States, alienating what little radical support he'd already had. Not that long ago, the Cambodians had freed themselves from the French. Now they were aligning with another non-Asian superpower. Were they going to be an American colony now? What's going on? Sihanouk hoped he'd be getting support both diplomatically and economically from the U.S. to fight the communists. Instead, Nixon, who he didn't know, was planning to withdraw from Vietnam, dropped a ton of bombs on Vietnamese camps in Cambodia. The bombing continued for more than a year with over 3,000 raids against Cambodian targets, and many Cambodians are fucking pissed, which I get. Right? The leader of their nation allows this other nation uh, you know, to, to drop all these bombs on their land for over a year. This causes many to see Sihanouk as a lapdog to the U.S., a sellout, a traitor. He should be protecting Cambodia for war, not allowing war to come to Cambodia. In the eastern part of the country, especially near Vietnam, the bombing turns many young men and women into communist revolutionaries. Uh, Washington Post journalist Stanley Carnow was told by Sihanouk uh, in 1967 in December that if the U.S. wanted to bomb the Vietnamese communist sanctuaries, he would not object unless Cambodians were killed. That same message was conveyed to U.S. President Johnson's uh, emissary, Chester Bowles, in January 1968. But then in order to avoid losing even more popularity with his people on March 26, 1968, Sihanouk delivers a public speech refuting the right of the U.S. to use any airstrikes in Cambodia, saying these criminal attacks must immediately and definitely stop. Right? He's trying to walk a weird line here behind closed doors. He's like, hey, no, it's okay. If you guys help us out with some aid, yeah, go ahead and just do your bombs. And then public is like, get out! No more bombs! Get out of here! Because he's... He knows the public won't support any kind of dealings with the U.S. at all. Two days after, um, you know, saying that the bombs need to stop, uh, a press conference is held and Sihanouk appeals to the international media on March 28, 1968, saying, I appeal to you to publicize abroad this very clear stand of Cambodia that I, or that is, I will in any case oppose all bombings on Cambodian territory under whatever pretext. So he's just posturing here, right? He's just playing a dangerous, crazy game. He's trying to appease these people and tell them one thing behind closed doors, and he has to tell the public something else. Uh, Sihanouk, uh, he didn't accomplish uh, much with all of this other than just to strain his relationship with the U.S. The U.S. would begin a secret bombing campaign called Operation Menu now against North Vietnamese forces on Cambodian, Cambodian soil. Uh, the following year, May of 1969, members of the Cambodian government and army begin to lose faith in Sihanouk for a variety of reasons. Some think he's not effectively standing up to the U.S. Others think he's not cooperating enough. He can't win. He was stuck in a shitty situation. Cambodia was a small nation compared to the other nations around it. They had less than 7 million total people in 1969. North Vietnam alone had around 20 million. You know, Vietnam in total had over 40 million. Many millions of additional communist supporters were in China. You know, the, the United States had over 200 million people. It's not like he could effectively stand up to fucking any of these people. Uh, while visiting Beijing in 1970, Sihanouk, ousted by a military coup led by Prime Minister General Lan Nol, that guy again, and, uh, and Prince Sisawath, uh, Srik Matak, U.S. support for the coup remains unproven, but it definitely fits the U.S.'s M.O., and many think the CIA was behind it. You know, they felt that, uh, you know, uh, Sihanouk was not being cooperative enough. He was starting to lean a little communist, so we got to get a new guy in there. Got to get a new puppet government to, uh, you know, do what we want them to do. While in exile in China, Sihanouk aligns with Pol Pot's CPK, right? The U.S. betrayed him. Now he's over with Pol Pot. Now he's in China. Uh, the Khmer Rouge, you know, they, they, they get this going. They're, they're forming a true guerrilla government uh, movement now. Over the next few years, the Cambodian army will steadily lose territory more and more against North Vietnamese and communist Khmer Rouge guerrillas, especially as the U.S. begins to de-escalate their involvement in Vietnam. There's a big power vacuum. The policies of Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge were radical adaptations of Maoist, Marxist, Leninist theories. They wanted to transform Cambodia into a rural, classless society comprised of collectivized farms. The regime focused on rural peasantry rather than urban pro proletariat. It emphasized great leap forward type initiatives. They sought, they, thought to, uh, they sought to abolish personal interest in human behavior, right? You're not to live life for yourself, not to live for the self. You're to live for the nation. Your life does not matter. What mattered was the life of the community. 
You're to be a worker ant. You're to focus on the, the health of the hive. Everything is about community with the Khmer Rouge. The Khmer Rouge promoted communal living and eating, simple living, farming, more value than technical knowledge. What it, what, you know, what it saw as common sense was more important than formal education. Remember how Pol Pot was a failed student? This feels like the kind of political system or ideological system an academic failure would create. Fuck education, fuck technology, fuck industrialization. Let's live in the past. Let's live simply. Like, like farmers used to live in medieval Europe during the Dark Ages when life was, you know, wasn't it so great? Isn't that what the Dark Ages is known for, life being great? No, it's fucking horrible. People died, you know, young and fucking horrible ways being beheaded by this king or that king or terrible, you know, diseases. You know, fuck big cities with professors and surgeons. Let's live in the country with no modern medicine and no education. Pol Pot was an idiot. It's back to 1970 and the coup that deposed, you know, King uh, Sihanouk by Premier Lan Nall with support of the National Assembly. Sihanouk in exile in Beijing makes an alliance with the Khmer Rouge. Like I said, becomes a nominal head of a Khmer Rouge-dominated government in exile, known by its French acronym GRUNK, backed in China. So how did this coup really happen? The road to power, the Khmer Rouge... Um, for the Khmer Rouge was opened by events in January of 1970. While he was out of the country, Sihanouk ordered the government to stage anti-Vietnamese protests in the capital. The protests quickly spilled out of control and the embassies of both North and South Vietnam were wrecked. Uh, Sihanouk, who had ordered the protests, now denounces them uh, from Paris and blames unnamed individuals in Cambodia for inciting them. These actions, along with clandestine operations by Sihanouk's followers in Cambodia, convinced the government that he should be removed as head of state. Right, he's doing that same thing he was doing earlier, where he's, you know, he's uh, privately saying one thing and publicly saying another, so people don't trust him. He gets, he gets outed. March 19th, 1970, Sihanouk is voted out of office by the National Assembly. Lan Nall steps in as president. The North Vietnamese react to the political changes in Cambodia by sending their premier, Pham Ban Dong, to meet Sihanouk in China. And there he recruits him into an alliance with the Khmer Rouge. At the same time, Pol Pot is contacted by the North Vietnamese who offer him whatever resources he needs to stage an insurgency against the Cambodian government. Remember, he doesn't love the Vietnamese, but they're going to help him achieve his goals. Shortly afterwards, Sihanouk is issued an appeal by radio but to the people of Cambodia, or, or he issues an appeal by radio to the people of Cambodia asking them to rise up against the government and to support the Khmer Rouge. On March 29, 1970, the North Vietnamese launch an offensive against the Cambodian army. A force of North Vietnamese quickly overruns large parts of eastern Cambodia, reaching to within 15 miles of Phnom Penh before being pushed back. By June of 1970, three months after the removal of Sihanouk, the North Vietnamese have swept government forces from the entire northeastern third of the country. After defeating those forces, the North Vietnamese turn the newly won territories over to local insurgents. The Khmer Rouge establishes liberated areas in the south and southwestern parts of the country where they operate independently of the North Vietnamese. In response to the North Vietnamese invasion, U.S. President Richard Nixon announces that the U.S. and South Vietnamese ground forces had entered Cambodia in a campaign aimed at destroying communist base areas in Cambodia, leading to a massive bombing campaign. In October of 1970, Pol Pot issues a resolution for Cambodia to decide its own future independent of the influence of any other country. The resolution includes statements describing the betrayal of the Cambodian socialist movement in the 1950s by the Viet Minh. This was the first statement of the anti-Vietnamese policy that would be a major part of the Pol Pot regime later when he took power. From 19, so it's kind of a weird thing, right? The North Vietnamese are helping him, but he just also hates the North Vietnamese. From 1970 until early 1972, the Cambodian conflict is fought largely between the government and army of Cambodia the Republican you know, Army of Cambodia, the Nationalists, and the armed forces of North Vietnam. As they gained control of more and more Cambodian territory, the Vietnamese communists imposed a new political infrastructure, which eventually the Khmer Rouge would be able to take over. The North Vietnamese attempts to overrun Cambodia in 1970 were apparently launched at the explicit request of the Khmer Rouge, according to documents uncovered from the Soviet archives after 1991. So it's all, this all seems confusing. It kind of is. You know, they're doing this publicly. There's, there's all these things like uh, it's all this disinformation, all this propaganda. You know, we don't like the Vietnamese. Fuck the Vietnamese. Saying that to the Cambodian people while at the same time in secret going over to the Vietnamese like, hey, man, thanks so much for helping us out. Oh, absolutely. You know, we'll become communists. We'll become trading partners. Everything's going to be great. All these secret dealings. You know, Pol Pot uh, publicly announced he doesn't want fuck all to do with Vietnamese, but he is secretly working with them to bring communism to Cambodia. Throughout 1971, the North Vietnamese uh, do most of the fighting against the Cambodian government, while Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge um, function as more of auxiliaries to their forces. 
As the North Vietnamese and the Khmer Rouge take more and more of Cambodia over, Pol Pot is able to gather more and more recruits and train them according to higher standards than were previously possible when he's working out of the shadows. While accepting anyone regardless of, the back, of their background into the Khmer Rouge army at that time, Pol Pot also uh, increases the requirements for membership into the actual political party. Students and so-called middle peasants are now rejected from membership. Those with clear peasant backgrounds, uh, they were included in membership. They were preferred. These restrictions were ironic in that most of the senior party leadership, including Pol Pot, came from student and middle peasant backgrounds. But he doesn't want anybody else like him. He wants these uh, poor peasants to be his, uh, his, you know, his group. They also create an intellectual split between the educated old guard, or this, you know, creates an intellectual split between the educated old guard party members and the uneducated peasant new party members. All part of Pol Pot's plan. This is all going to make a little more sense later. It's fucking crazy what he did. Pol Pot toured the insurgent North Vietnamese-controlled areas in Cambodia in 1972. China's helping him out. They're supplying $5 million a year in weapons. Uh, Pol Pot organizes an independent revenue source for the party in the form of rubber plantations in eastern Cambodia. He uses forced labor. Makes some money for uh, more weapons. Meanwhile, in non-communist controlled parts of the country, a constitution is adopted. A parliament is elected. And Lan Nall goes on uh, to become president from being prime minister, which is really just a name change. He's doing the same shit. He's still leading. Uh, the communists still not totally in charge of the entire country yet. And then in May of 1972, after a central committee meeting, the party under the direction of Pol Pot begins to enforce new levels of discipline and conformity in areas under their control. Minorities such as the Cham people, an ethnic group who are primarily Muslim, they're forced to conform to traditional Cambodian styles of dress and appearance now. These policies, such as forbidding the Chams from wearing jewelry, will soon be extended to the entire population. Uh, a haphazard version of land reform gets put underway as well. Its basis was that all land holdings should be of uniform size. Everyone gets the same amount of property. Uh, the party also confiscates private means of transportation. The 1972 policies were aimed at reducing the peoples of liberated areas uh, to a sort of feudal peasant equality. This would get more severe as time goes on. These policies were generally favorable to most people at the time, because they were already poor peasants. But then when, uh, you know, refugees from towns were sent out to these farms, uh, they, they didn't like it as much. 1973, the CPK were fighting battles against government forces with little or no North Vietnamese troop support now. The North Vietnamese had mostly returned to North and South Vietnam to fight their own other battles. The CPK in 1973 now uh, controlled nearly 60% of Cambodia's territory. So, you know, it took a while for this takeover. They controlled 25% of the population. US B-52 bombardment of, Cambodian, uh, of the Cambodian countryside in support of Lan Nol forces uh, reaches its peak in 1973. 250,000 tons of bombs dropped in seven months before US Congress uh, calls a halt to the bombing in August 15, 1973. Uh, the bombing does little to stop the progress of the CPK. If anything, it strengthens their movement. The death toll from 1969 to 1973 was somewhere between 50 and 150,000 civilian deaths from the bombing. Some sources claim as many as 300,000 deaths. Well, Pol Pot uses the bombing's uh, killings, you know, and destruction as recruitment propaganda, uh, as an excuse for the abandonment of moderate socialist policies in the insurgent zones. Right? We gotta, we gotta, we gotta do something about this. They're, they're killing us. Purges of moderate communists suspected of disloyalty to Pol Pot occur now more and more. It's, it's literal do or die time, motherfuckers. You're with us, you're against us, right? You're part of the solution or you're fucking dead. Uh, the Khmer Rouge takes over more of Cambodia during mid-1973. They reach the outskirts of Phnom Penh. And then Pol Pot orders uh, that the city be taken during the peak of the rainy season. Now the Khmer Rouge under Pol Pot control almost two-thirds of the country, half the population. Late 1973, Pol Pot makes strategic decisions to determine the future of the war. He decides to cut the capital off from contact with the outside world, with sources of supplies, putting the city under siege. He enforces tight control over people trying to leave the city through Khmer Rouge lines. He orders a series of general purges of former government officials, anyone with an education. Dude is still pissed about struggling in school. He wants the fucking educated killed now. All right, he's all, what about that homework now, professor? Huh? It's out back in the trash where I'm going to dump your fucking body. Hey, professor, here's your new assignment. Get stupid or fucking die quick. Bad news, motherfuckers. I'm super intimidated by anyone smarter than me or educated. And I didn't do well in school and I'm dumb. So if you're a D student or better, if you graduated from any place ever, no algebra equation or spelling bee trophy is going to save you from the Pol Pot equation. Learning plus doing gooder than me equals bullet to brain, which I'm pretty sure is in your chest. So I'm going to shoot there. Who, who's laughing? 
How terrifying would it be to live while this is going on? If you had any education, if you're intellectually curious at all, if you're anything other than a poor villager, I mean, the lunatics are truly running the asylum now in more and more of Cambodia. A new set of prisons is constructed in areas under Khmer Rouge controls this time to detain and torture anybody they don't feel like killing right away. In late 1973, the Cham people attempt an uprising to stop the destruction of their culture because, you know, uh, now the only culture you're allowed to have is Pol Pot's communist culture, which is no culture, right? They've gotten rid of religion. No traditions are welcome. You're loyal to the state and the state alone. You're an egoless worker bee devoted to the hive. Well, this upri uprising is quickly crushed. Pol Pot orders the harsh physical torture be used against most of those involved in the revolt to send a message to others to not revolt. Pol Pot tests out harsh new policies against the Cham minorities uh, before extending them to the general population of the country, just like he used them as guinea pigs before for his dress code. Also in late, late 1973, Pol Pot decides that urban dwellers are of no use to his new agrarian experiment. And he starts to evacuate some towns, sending the entire populations of towns out into the rice fields, out into the countryside. He writes at this time, if the result of so many sacrifices was that the capitalists remain in control, what was the point of the revolution? In 1974, the Khmer Rouge evacuates a small city of Udang. 12,000 people are marched out into the countryside or executed for being teachers, for being doctors, uh, for being smarty pantses. This shit's insane. It's, it's rumored that a lot of people were killed uh, for wearing glasses. I'm not even fucking kidding. Right? For looking like they were readers. Right? They read a lot. So they're probably smarty pantses and they need to be killed. Uh, oh my God. Imagine if like the dumb bully you went to school with was put in charge of everything and given a license to kill. And he got all the other dumb bullies together and they just got to run the show. This is basically what life was like for these people. Uh, and this might be a good place to kind of take a pause and ask, what did the international community think about all this uh, shit going on? Uh, surprisingly, uh, they were for it because they didn't really know what was going on. Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge gained the recognition of 63 countries as the true government of Cambodia. At this time, even the UN gave the seat uh, for Cambodia to the Khmer Rouge. It may seem surprising, but remember, Cambodia has been in upheaval since at least the 40s when it was ruled by France. It's not like the monarchy didn't murder people. Uh, and communists, they were just really good at keeping secrets. So no one in the international community really knew exactly what was going on in Cambodia. And because of Vietnam and other nearby conflicts that were you know, deemed as you know, uh, potentially more hazardous to the international community, there just wasn't much focus on them. People were distracted by other things going on. In the fall of 1974, cities are emptied of their populations in Cambodia. You know, more cities, more people purged, more people sent to the countryside. Pol Pot begins to purge more members of the Khmer Rouge. He's getting paranoid. A top party official named Prasith was taken out into the forest, shot without being given any chance to defend himself in September of 1974. His death was followed by a purge of many other comrades who, like uh, Prasith, were ethnically Thai. Pol Pot's explanation for their deaths was that a class struggle could tear the party apart, right? They had to stay strong. They had to cleanse the party of anyone who could be holding on to old class ties like the Thai people, who he'd always felt had held themselves uh, as being superior to Cambodians. So basically he was like, listen, I'm fucking racist, okay? All right? Yeah, I'm racist. All right, sure. And I don't like the Thai people, so fuck them, okay? And other guys were like, all right, okay, all right, okay. Uh, yeah, it's insanity. By the beginning of 1975, the Khmer Rouge had gained control of nearly all of Cambodia. They positioned themselves for a final offensive against the Republican government in January of 75. Uh, on April 17, 75, the Khmer Rouge seizes control of the country's capital city after, you know, attacking it for months. Phnom Penh, effectively ousting the Lan Nol government. Now as the leader of the Communist Party, Pol Pot becomes the de facto leader of the country. He adopts the title Brother Number One. He's, just, he's your brother. Your fucking crazy brother who kills you if you read. Uh, within a week, the people of Phnom Penh, Batambang, other cities are purged or uh, for being too uppity or being too educated. Uh, or they're driven into the countryside by the Red Khmer and told to take up agricultural tasks. So strange. He just emptied the cities. Imagine if you're working as a shopkeeper. You're a car salesman, an accountant, you're a movie theater usher, whatever. Anything, just any kind of job you could have in town or in the city. And then soldiers kick you out of your apartment or condo or house. You know, they literally take all your shit. They give you a simple peasant uniform to wear, a garden hoe, right? They, they tell you to get to farming or be killed. You can sleep in a big communal living space. You'll be given just enough food not to die quickly. That was the reality for people kicked out of Phnom Penh. Those leaving initially were told the evacuation was due to the threat of severe American bombing. 
right? This is help to get them out there faster. It's going to last for no more than a few days. You'll get to return home. Nope. Thousands of evacuees, especially the very old and very young, died over the next few weeks. Some survivors walking towards regions where they hoped the relatives would welcome them were on the road for over a month. When they asked questions of the heavily armed young soldiers who accompanied them as they're being evacuated and marched out into the countryside, they're just told to obey the revolutionary organization and that the uh, you know, organization will now act as their mother and father. The evacuees were called new people or April 17 people because they had joined the revolution so late. So they're looking, they're, they're looked down upon. Residents of the countryside were known as the base people and they're treated less harshly than the new people. After emptying the cities, the revolutionary organization embarks on a program of social transformation that affects every aspect of Cambodian life. Money, markets, private property, nationwide are abolished. Schools, universities, Buddhist monasteries are closed. You fucking hear the schools, they close the schools. It's like, fuck schools. You know, no publishing is allowed. The postal system is shut down for the whole country. Freedom of movement, exchange of information, personal adornment, leisure activities of any kind are over. Punishments for infractions are severe. Repeat offenders are imprisoned under harsh conditions or killed. Everyone's ordered to perform tasks set for them by the, by the, you know, communists, by the Khmer Rouge. For evacuee city dwellers, these tasks seldom had anything to do with their training or skills. You know, the, all of them were forced to become peasants or, you know, were forced to become soldiers. They're made to wear identical black cotton clothing. The Khmer Rouge coined the phrase year zero to symbolize everyone's radically different new life. Forget what your life was before. That doesn't fucking matter now. Now your life is going to be what we tell you it is. Hundreds of thousands of the upper educated and middle classes are tortured and executed in special uh, prisons and centers. Others starve or die from disease or, or exhaustion. Tragically, the international community still doesn't know that this is happening. Uh, not yet. The outside world is told that Cambodia is being ruled by the United Front government. The leftover of the Cambodian monarchy government led by the deposed king of Cambodia, uh, Noradam you know, Sihanouk, when in reality he's a secret communist. This charade continues for the remainder of 1975. January of 1976, the revolutionary organization dissolves the United Front and the Khmer Rouge, led by Pol Pot, officially changes the name of the country to Democratic Kampuchea. They sign a new constitution. The constitution praises collective values, identifies the revolutionary organization with the people's interests, and formalizes the collectivization of Cambodian life. Soon after, Radio Phnom Penh announces that elections will be held for a national assembly. It broadcasts the names of the ministers in the new regime. The elections, it seems, were primarily for overseas consumption, primarily for an audience uh, of people in the UN checking in on Cambodia. It was just a fake election. Uh, most new people were not allowed to vote. Base people were basically told who to vote for. Uh, everyone who got elected was a member of the Khmer Rouge uh, in, these, in these free elections. In April of 1976, the newly established Representative Assembly holds its first session, electing a new government with Pol Pot as prime minister. Right? This is all for show. It's just the same dudes. Uh, Pol Pot's goal for this new country was to have 70 to 80% of the nation set up for mechanized collective farming within five to 10 years. He wanted to uh, build a modern industrial base off the back of the farm mechanization from, you know, within 15 to 20 years and then become a self-sufficient state, like totally self-sufficient. This is kind of his great leap forward plan. Uh, to avoid foreign domination of industries, he refuses to purchase goods from any other countries now. Q famine. Uh, the Khmer Rouge systematically then starts to destroy food sources that could not be easily subjected to centralized storage and control. They cut down fruit trees. They forbid fishing for some reason. Uh, they abolish medicine in hospitals because they're fucking idiots. They force people to march long distances without access to water, you know, in their agricultural kind of situations. They refuse offers of humanitarian aid. Why are they making all these decisions? I mean, partly it really is because they're stupid. I'm not just saying that to be a dick. I mean, they killed the educated people. Pol Pot was not a smart man. He was able to memorize some French literature. He was able to read and absorb some communistic ideology. But overall, there's a reason he was held back a couple years in school and couldn't get into college. He just wasn't very smart. He was confident. He was ruthless. He was on the right side of the Cold War. You know, he was at the right place in time to be the kind of communist he was. He was not a brilliant leader. He killed doctors. He killed educators. He tried to turn everyone into either soldiers or farmers, regardless of their skill sets. He was a fucking idiot. Pol He's the stupidest dictator I've ever read about. It's infuriating. Pol Pot said shortly after coming into power that the first step in progress was to exterminate an entire class, and he killed the smart class. 
Ah, in mid-1976, Pol Pot's regime reclassified Kampuchians into three groupings, those with full rights, those who were candidates for full rights, and those with no rights who couldn't ever be given rights. They were known as depositees. This last group, the depositees, um, included new people who had been brought in from the cities into the communes, and the depositees were marked for destruction, these poor bastards. Their rations were, were two bowls of rice soup a day, which he knew was not enough for a human to live on, and he didn't give a fuck. It was intentional. They were given just enough food to work on the farms for a little while until they starved to death, and then good riddance. Uh, the Khmer Rouge leadership boasted over the state-controlled radio. They would broadcast this stuff so everybody could hear that only one or two million people were needed to build their new agrarian socialist utopia. They said this to a country that still has over six million people. How fucked up is that? They're basically just announcing that over two-thirds of you motherfuckers are completely and totally expendable. And they meant it. God, man. And, and you know what? Maybe I would get that if there was like a lot of traffic. Right? If it was super overcrowded. JK, kind of. Uh, but come on, Pol Pot. You weren't even starting off with that many people. And how do you think he'd defend his little communist utopia of a million to two million people? Right? If he got down to those numbers, if someone were to attack later. Oh, yeah. He didn't think about that because he was a fucking idiot. And as for all the people they didn't need, here's what he said. This is a famous Khmer Rouge quote. He said, to keep you is to, sorry, I'm going to start over. To keep you is no benefit. To destroy you is no loss. That was his philosophy. After this announcement, hundreds of thousands of the new people, the depositees, those unable to work on the farms, those who they just didn't trust for whatever reason, were taken out in shackles to dig their own mass graves. And then Khmer soldiers buried them alive. Uh, a Khmer Rouge extermination prison directive ordered bullets are not to be wasted. Right? They didn't even bother to shoot these people. Mass graves such as this are often referred to now as the killing fields of Cambodia. The Khmer Rouge had a diabolical disregard for human life. The mayhem that the democratic Cambodia inflicted on his people led the French author Jean Le Couture to coin the word autogenocide, which means the extermination of a country's citizens by its own people or government, genocide of a particular group by members of that group. It's like all, all obviously all genocide is terrible and horrible and evil, but this is like an especially idiotic, like he's just, he's just killing themselves. It's like, it's so stupid on so many levels. In less than four years, more than a million Cambodians or one in seven die from malnutrition, overwork and illnesses that could have been treated if they hadn't killed the doctors. At least 100,000, probably many more, executed for crimes against the state. Tens of thousands of others perish in military conflict. Declaring that the nation would start again at year zero, Pol Pot isolates his people from the rest of the world. He empties all the cities, right? He abolishes the money, private property religion. He sets up these rural collectives. Black-clad soldiers marching millions of people into the countryside, putting them into work as slaves, digging canals and tending crops. And then, you know, he, as he touched on earlier, he's just executing everyone who's not Cambodian as well. Just because he didn't want them, they weren't part of his vision. He convinces his uh, you know, fellow communists that they should exterminate all people who are not of Khmer ethnicity, you know, ethnic Vietnamese, ethnic Thai, ethnic Chinese, ethnic Cham. They gotta all be executed. You know, uh, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, anyone adhering to a belief system still, you know, or caught worshiping, caught praying, they're executed. Nearly 25,000 Buddhist monks are executed by the regime. Uh, the Khmer Rouge continues targeting intellectuals, those they view as having any contact with outside governments, especially the U.S., right? Teachers, doctors, lawyers targeted and killed. You know, if they found out that you were a lawyer before, you know, even if you pretended to be a peasant, you're killed. Pol Pot and his comrades also set up a new judicial system that was a bit harsh. Anyone found guilty of a minor crime is given a warning. If you got more than two warnings, you were sent off to prison for a re-education, which almost always meant death. If you were found guilty of a major crime, you were just killed immediately. People were often encouraged to confess to pre-revolutionary lifestyles and crimes, right? Things that happened before the Khmer Rouge took over, you know, which usually included just basically like free market activity, you know, had they had contacts with foreign sources, were they trading with any other nations, were they talking with anybody from the U.S., were they working with any international relief or, you know, government agency, did they have contact with any foreigners at all before the Khmer Rouge took over, they were told they'd be forgiven if they confessed and that the slate would be wiped clean, they could start over. And then if they confessed, they were fucking killed. <laughs> they were taken to places like S21, this uh, notorious prison for torture and or execution. This place, the S21 prison in Phnom Penh was once a high school. And the head of S21 was Kong Kek Lu, better known as Brother Doik, uh, a former school teacher. 
who, who ran a pretty tight, scary ship where both guards and inmates feared for their lives. In a memo from a meeting, uh, Doig told an interrogator, remind him about the welfare of his wife and children. Does he know that his wife and children have been detained? Now that he is here, does he know what will become of his wife? Uh, the guards, interrogators, other prison staff at S21 were between 15 and 19 years old. From peasant backgrounds. Brother Doik was, you know, in charge of them. He's a huge piece of shit. He later confessed to overseeing the deaths of over 12,000 people in four years. Saying at a court where he was uh, tried for war crimes, I am solely and individually responsible for the loss of at least 12,380 lives. Right, an average of over eight executions a day. Most were not executed at the prison. Most were tortured into confessing crimes they couldn't have possibly committed uh, many times. Then they were loaded onto trucks, driven to the notorious killing fields of Sheng Ek, where they were bludgeoned to death with ox cart handles or axles, excuse me. Sheng Ek is a village where mass graves containing 6,426 sets of human remains were discovered after the fall of the Khmer Rouge regime. Of all the human remains exhumed from Sheng Ek, an, or an orchard transformed into a mass grave site, only one skull, one, was discovered without indications of torture or heavy beating. One skull out of almost 6,500. Of the victims, over 1,600 were women, almost 5,000 were men, 17 were kids, the youngest of whom was only three years old. And that's just one of many mass graves. In order to save ammunition, the executions were often carried out using poison, spades, sharpened bamboo sticks, or they were just tossed in and buried alive. Uh, there's evidence of bayonets, knives, wooden clubs, hoes for farming, curved scythes being used to kill victims. You know, there's images of skulls damaged by these implements uh, as evidence. Sometimes the, the kids and infants of adult victims were killed by having their heads bashed against the trunk of a tree and then just tossed into the pit alongside their parents. The rationale for killing the children was to stop them growing up and taking revenge for their parents' deaths. Only 12 people out of the thousands that went through S21 uh, were alive at the end of the regime's rule. 12 are, are only 12 are known to have made it out. One man referred to only by his name of May, who testified at Doik's trial, was kept in a three by five foot cell for nearly a year, shackled by his ankles, taken out only to be interrogated, tortured, or put to work. His ability to repair sewing machines is the only reason he was kept alive until he was evacuate, evacuated in the Khmer Rouge's final days in power when they were trying to move their prisoners to another location. May recounted the torturers used to extract false confessions from prisoners, forced them into implicating others as CIA spies. They were paranoid about the CIA. He was beaten with bamboo rods, forced to eat human shit, given electric shocks, right? He had his toenails ripped out with pliers. God damn, it sounded like the fucking showbiz. Albert Fish was brought over to oversee torture. He's one of the dudes who lived. Others were waterboarded, hung upside down and beaten, had their heads uh, or, you know, hands crushed in clamps amongst other horrors before being killed. Children were witnessed being literally tossed by guards off a of third story balconies to their deaths. May recorded the Khmer Rouge's final cruelty inflicted uh, upon him during the regime's last days. Marched from prison by his jailers, right? Other, the Vietnamese forces are closing in on him. They're trying to get to a new location. By sheer chance, May comes across his wife and the young son he'd never met, born weeks after he was sent to prison. They're marched north at gunpoint for two days. Then without warning, they're woken up at midnight, ordered to run into a rice field. At, once they start to run into the rice field, the soldiers open fire. This poor bastard would say at this trial later, just a couple years ago, as we ran, we were sprayed with bullets. My wife fell. She screamed to me, you have to escape. I look back to see another friend shot and fall to the ground. My wife was already dead. My son was crying for a moment. Then he was shot too. And this is a baby we're talking about. I escaped into the forest. Motherfucker. These are innocent human beings. Can you imagine that shit? Soldiers who've been torturing you for a year, take you and your wife. You know, they've probably been torturing or raping her. They take your infant son, tell you to run out in the middle of the night into a rice paddy and then just open fire just for the fuck of it. There was no military advantage to doing this. They knew at this point the war was lost, right? This is just done out of hatred and an evil spite. So how did this insanity finally come to an end? January of 1977, relations with Vietnam began to fall apart. There were small border clashes. Pol Pot tried to prevent border disputes by sending a team of diplomats, diplomats excuse me, to Vietnam. Negotiations fail. The border disputes continue. On April 30th, 1977, the Cambodian army, backed by artillery, crossed into Vietnam, kicking off the Cambodia-Vietnam War. Dumb move. Vietnamese uh, much stronger. Right? Classic Pol Pot. A uh, second massive wave of bloody purges occurs inside Cambodia after kicking off this war. An attempt to eliminate all dissident communists, other moderates, 
right? Recalcitrants, they're paranoid. They're killing their own party members. The purges spread to the mass of the peasantry as well. They're killing their, even the peasants who he valued the most. It's just madness. Everyone's killing everyone. Cambodia launches military attacks now against uh, other countries, Thailand, Laos. Classic pot, doubling down on madness. He just pushed the fuck it all button. September 1977, Cambodia launches division-scale raids over the border, which once again left a trail of murder and destruction in villages. The Vietnamese claim that over a thousand of their people are killed or injured. Uh, three days after this raid, Pol Pot officially announces the existence of the Communist Party of Kampuchea to the world, which is weird. He waited until this point to say, like, hey, I'm in charge. You know, everybody knew by this point. May of 1978, the massive purges spark an uprising in the eastern zone of Cambodia in opposition to the Khmer Rouge. Of course they did. When you start killing everyone indiscriminately, of course, eventually people are going to revolt. They have nothing to lose. Pol Pot's armies are able to crush this revolt, uh, or, or they're unable, excuse me, to crush this revolt quickly. And the people revolting sneak into Vietnam, call for help from Hanoi. On May 10th, 1978, Pol Pot's radio station broadcasts a call to exterminate the 50 million Vietnamese and to purify the masses of people of Cambodia. He's just, he's completely crazy. Just kill all the Vietnamese. We got to kill them all. We got to kill most of the people of Cambodia. At least 100,000 more Khmer are ex exterminated in six months, branded as Khmer bodies with Vietnamese minds. He, right? Now he's killing people because he thinks they have a Vietnamese mind. Right? He thinks they just, ah, you look a little Vietnamese to me. Ah, you probably, probably don't like me. Let's kill you. December 25th, 1978, Christmas Day, in response to threats to its borders and the Vietnamese people, Vietnam attacks Cambodia to overthrow the Khmer Rouge, which Vietnam justifies on the basis of self-defense. Uh, Vietnam was no longer now North and South Vietnam, by the way. They unified in 1976 into one big group of socialists who could easily crush their fucking insane Cambodian neighbors. And that's exactly what they did. Barely two weeks later, on January 7th, 1979, Phnom Penh falls to the Vietnamese to install a new regime. And this begins 11 years of Vietnamese occupation in Cambodia. Mom has custody of Cambodia again. No more junk food this time. Fun dad doesn't get to visit on weekends. Some Cambodians celebrate January 7th as a liberation day from the Khmer Rouge. Others mark it as the, uh, you know, the start of the Vietnamese occupation. The Khmer Rouge is defeated. Pol Pot is forced to flee. He makes it to the Thailand border area. The People's Republic of Kampuchea is established as a pro-Soviet communist state now, led by the Kampuchean People's Revolutionary Party. <sighs> the party was created by the Vietnamese in 1951, led by a group of Khmer Rouge who had fled Cambodia to avoid being purged by Pol Pot. So this is great. So we can fucking kick one group of Khmer Rouge out, and then we get a new, not as evil group. They're going to be in charge of Cambodia now. Uh, and then Pol Pot is captured and executed. I wish. No. Pol Pot uh, regroups with core supporters in the Thai border area. He receives shelter and assistance. His plan is to get help from Thailand, which was not a big fan of Vietnam, also help from China, and then just, you know, start it all up all over again. The People's Republic of China was the main international supporter of Mr. Pot and his assholes, and the Chinese provides them uh, financial military support as they hide out in the jungle while others are trying to capture him. Uh, back in Phnom Penh, uh, Pot is sentenced to death. He's found guilty of genocide and absentia by a war crimes court, but they have to find him before they can execute him, and they can't find him. Maybe they're not trying that hard for some reason. In the early 80s, Pol Pot continues to hide out in the jungle, he gives very few interviews, accusing all those who oppose him of being traitors and puppets of the Vietnamese. He disappears from public view. In 1985, Pol Pot's retirement from leading the Khmer Rouge is announced, but he supposedly still retains influence over the party. Cambodia is plagued, meanwhile, by guerrilla warfare, making catching him a low priority. Right? they got other problems to deal with. Hundreds of thousands of Cambodians become refugees. During this time, an interview is done with one of Pot's associates about how Pol Pot felt bad about the killing fields. This is what he said. Uh, this guy speaking on Pol Pot's behalf. He said, he said that he knows that many people in the country hate him and think he's responsible for the killings. He said that he knows many people died. When he said this, he nearly broke down and cried. I, I like nearly. I, he didn't cry. He's not going to cry about millions of people dying. No, he's just, but almost, he seemed like a, like a, like a little bit of water in one eye for a second. He said he must accept responsibility because the line was too far to the left because he didn't keep proper track of what was going on. He said he was like the master in a house. He, he didn't know what the kids were up to. And that he trusted people too much. For example, he allowed one person to take care of central committee business from him, another person to take care of intellectuals, and a third person to take care of political education. These were people whom he felt very close to. He trusted them completely. Then in the end, they made a mess of everything. They would tell him things that were not true, that everything was fine. 
and that this person or that person was a traitor, in the end, they were the real traitors. The major problem had been, you know, these groups formed by the Vietnamese. Classic sociopath behavior. This feels like some shit one of the serial killers we covered would say. Just blame, blame, blame. No, man. <laughs> listen, 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 listen. I'm not some evil motherfucker responsible for the deaths of, you know, over a million innocent people. That's not, that's not me. I, I put Bob in charge. I put Bob in charge of the farms. And that's, you know what? Looking back, that's where I fucked up. That's my fault. Now, now I know that Bob is a murderous sociopath. I'm, you know what? I'm too trusting. I always have been. If anything, I'm guilty of being too nice of a guy. Oh, and it's also the Vietnamese people's fault. I mean, fucking classic Vietnamese, right? They, they, they created all this. I mean, am I right or am I right? Uh, December of 1985, the Vietnamese launch a major offensive, overrun most of the remaining Khmer Rouge and other insurgents, but they don't get full pot. The Khmer Rouge hidden headquarters, another important jungle base, they're completely destroyed. But Pol Pot is able to flee to Thailand, where he hides out, lives for the next six years. His headquarters is a plantation villa near Trot, Thailand, where he continues to be the de facto leader of the radical Khmer Rouge. This group is somehow still alive. He's back in Siam, back in Thailand, back, back with Fun Dad. Uh, if Trat sounds familiar, it's because uh, Trat uh, was in the news recently. The jungles around Trat, Thailand are home to the gray Quam Thai spider. Ugh, odd spider uh, with 10 legs instead of the normal eight. Entomologists just discovered these fucking creeps about 15 years ago. Super poison, or excuse me, venomous. <laughs> I almost, you, know, you almost caught me. I said venomous instead of, uh, first thought to be very rare, but they've been, uh, I guess, fucking a whole bunch in the jungle. And there's a lot of them now. And some idiot tourist smuggled one of these things, or I guess several of these things back to the U.S. They were found in the San Diego, or in the San Diego airport about two weeks ago. Uh, looked like they got them all, but then a dead one was found in some lady's home just outside of Denver a few days ago. Time is going to tell if they're here to stay in the United States or not, uh, or not. I hope not. They're twice as venomous as black widows. Their bite is said to be legendarily painful. Feels like you know, your blood has been set on fire. If you do get bitten by one of these creeps, uh, there's currently no anti-venom. In the animal world, these little bastards, which are much smaller than black widow spiders, about the size of a large carpenter ant, they prefer to crawl in a victim's ear, bite them inside their head so that when the creature tries to defend itself, it can't smush them. And then they will crawl out when the creature is dead. Uh, they're thought to be very closely related to the Roanoke recluse spider. And in a perfect storm, they work with the Roanoke to kill you. Teams of Roanokes lifting your eyelids, crawling into your eyeballs, little spider legs, walking around your eyeballs. And then the gray qualm tay spiders crawling into your ears, biting you inside your head, lighting you up with fire blood. I just wanted to pass that along. If you feel like something crawling on you, especially in your bed when you're about to try to fall asleep, which is usually when spiders go after you, it's probably one of these fucked up, you know, gray qualm tay spiders. Uh, also, in case you hadn't heard the Roanoke recluse lies uh, much earlier in the suck, I, I did just make all that up. <laughs> Gosh dang! Sorry for making your skin crawl. Let's move on. Just forget, forget about it. Just forget about the spider stuff. In 1986, Pol Pot's new wife, Mia Sun, gives birth to a daughter, Sitha, because life is not fair. And sometimes good people die horribly and evil fucks just live long lives. Shortly afterwards, Pol Pot moves to China for medical treatment. Oh my God, he gets medical treatment for cancer. Unreal. The dude who killed doctors. The, the balls on this guy. He's getting medical treatment. Uh, life really not fair sometimes. Pol Pot remains in China until 1988. In 1989, Vietnamese troops withdraw from Cambodia. The country is renamed the state of Cambodia. Buddhism reestablished as a state religion. And the Khmer Rouge, they're fucking still around. They establish a new stronghold in the jungles of West Cambodia near the Thai border. Pol Pot relocates back to Cambodia from Thailand. July 7th, 1994, the Khmer Rouge finally outlawed by a new Cambodian government. They'd never been officially totally outlawed before. A few guerrillas don't surrender. One of them is Pol Pot. Uh, the, the others, thousands of others are given amnesty when they surrender. Pol Pot is still uh, alive, still free. 1995, Pol Pot, either 67 or 70 years old, depending on which birth date is correct, has a stroke, paralyzes the left side of his body, still alive, still free. June 10th, 1997, Pol Pot orders the execution of his lifelong right-hand man, Son Sen, for attempting to make a settlement with the Cambodian government. To, to, this guy was trying to get some amnesty and come out of hiding. Pol Pot finds out, executes not only Son Sen, or Son Sen, also executes 11 members of his family. Dude is still executing people in the Cambodian jungle in 1997. After these executions, he flees again, makes it to a northern stronghold, 
Nine days, he's fucking like, he's like Bin Laden before they killed him. He's fucking sneaking around. Nine days later, Pol Pot is arrested by Khmer Rouge military chief, Tomok. Good, right? Not really. Following months, he's just put through a little show trial, just amongst his own little Khmer Rouge buddies. They, they, they put him on trial for the death of San Sen, and they sentence him to lifelong house arrest, which is what he's already doing. <sighs> also in July of 77, Cambodia asked the UN to help create a court to prosecute the surviving top leaders of the Khmer Rouge. They should have ha- asked for help for finding these fuckers because they're terrible at it. I really do feel like killing all the country's smart people just had a lot of bad repercussions for Cambodia over the next, you know, many years. He killed thousands of former government workers, killed all the educated. You know, he had the detectives and stuff killed. No wonder he's able to hide so well. And, that's, and again, that's not me being a dick, right? Part of the reason Cambodia struggled to recover in the years after Pol Pot's regime took over is truly because, right, he killed like a couple generations of the nation's best minds. Nearly a year later, April 15th, 1998, the United States ran Voice of Amer- ran a uh, Voice of America radio program. Uh, Pol Pot was a devoted listener to this radio program and it, it announced that the Khmer Rouge had agreed to turn him over to an international tribunal. Finally, after all these years, right, they're going to, they're, the Khmer Rouge is going to turn on this guy and toss him over. According to his wife, he died in his bed that night. Said to be 78 years old. His official cause of death was heart failure, but most believe he committed suicide overdosed on prescription medication Valium, which he shouldn't have had because he didn't like doctors. He had a far better death than he deserved, and that takes us out of our last Time Suck timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Uh, So what a piece of shit, huh? Uh, Yay, communism. So fun. So fun. Between 1.4 and 2 to 3 million people died between 1975 and 1979 at the hands of Pol Pot's regime. Right? Killing fields, reminders of the colossal tragedy dot the country of Cambodia. More than 20,000 mass grave sites contain more than 1.38 million bodies, according to the Documentation Center of Cambodia. The violent legacy of the Khmer Rouge uh, regime and its aftermath continue to haunt Cambodia to this day. In recent years, increasing attention has been paid by the world to the atrocities of the Khmer Rouge, especially in light of the Cambodia Tribunal. In Cambodia, the Tul Slang Genocide Museum, the Shung Ek Killing Fields, two major sites open to the public, which uh, which are preserved from the Khmer Rouge years and serve as sites of memory of the Cambodian genocide. Beyond these two public sites, not much has been done to the Cambodian government to remember the genocide that occurred. Why? Well, because former members are currently members of the government. Right? Because numerous Khmer Rouge associates, uh, you know, associated groups remain in political power in the wake of the collapse of the Khmer Rouge empire or regime. The continued influence of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia's politics has led to a neglect of the teaching of the Khmer Rouge history to Cambodian children. After World War II, man, the Nazis, they were stomped the fuck out, but not so with the Khmer Rouge. It's made closure harder to attain in some ways. In 2006, the Cambodian tribunal was set up to charge those former Khmer Rouge officials for war crimes, but to date, they've only convicted three men. On September 19th, 2007, excuse me, Nguyen Chia, second in command of the Khmer Rouge, its most senior surviving member, charged with war crimes, crimes against humanity. He was convicted on August 7th, 2014, and received a life sentence. Big fucking deal. He was given that sentence when he was 88 years old. Died last year at the age of 93. Q Sampan. Uh, the Khmer Rouge chief of state also sentenced to life in prison for crimes against humanity in 2014. He was 85. Really glad these guys are getting some justice. This guy's still alive. Uh, July 26, 2010. Comrade, uh, right, uh, Doik, director of that S-21 prison camp. Convicted of crimes against humanity. Initially only sentenced to 35 years. And then his sentence was reduced to 19 years. What the fuck? Uh, February 2, 2012, his sentence was extended to life in prison by the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. How, how was that not done immediately? Dude admitted to overseeing the executions of over 12,000 people and they were going to give him 35 years and then re- reduced it to 19. Uh, he's 77, still alive. Uh, no other former Khmer Rouge members will probably ever be punished. Uh, the current leader of Cambodia, Hun Sen, he is a former Khmer Rouge battalion commander. His battalion fled to Vietnam in 1977 uh, during one of uh, Pol Pot's insane purges of his own people. I mean, can you imagine that a former Nazi leader, you know, a former Nazi like a uh, battalion commander becoming the leader of Germany in the 50s or 60s or something? It's, it just speaks to how messy life is in Cambodia, how it was and still is. Cambodia remains one of the poorest, least, least developed countries in Asia. Pol Pot of the Khmer Rouge responsible for so much of that. 
Cambodia's standard of health, level of education, care for the environment, other indicators of quality of life still need to be vastly improved. Will this country finally really heal? Probably not until all the members of the Khmer Rouge are dead. When former members are no longer still running the country, right? So the people can talk about it more openly. Man, what's crazy to me is how some people after hearing stories like this still think communism could work. Like, no, capitalism has its evils, but communism, man, fuck communism. Pol Pot's version was especially brutal, but when has it ever been awesome? Who wants to be a worker bee, forced to pretend they're the same as everyone else? That is not human nature. That's not natural. Some people are born faster. Let them run. Admire them for their speed. Don't try and slow them down and not stand out just because you don't happen to be as fast because they intimidate you. Fuck that. That's loser mentality bullshit. Some people are born with a beautiful voice and immense musical abilities. Let them sing louder than the rest of us. It's okay. They can sing better than you can. Don't try and silence them. Don't try and shut them up and so they don't get more praise for singing than you or the rest of us. I don't like communism for the same reason. I don't like that every kid gets a trophy bullshit. It's dishonest. It doesn't speak to true human nature. Some stars burn brighter than others and they always fucking will. It's the way of the world. Doesn't mean you can't enjoy your life, right? Plenty of comics are more successful than me. I'm okay with that. Plenty of podcasters are more successful than me. I'm fine with that. There are people who have more money, who are better looking, better shape, et cetera. It's okay. I'm still happy. There's always going to be someone doing better than you in some way. Just accept it. It's okay. I like what I've got. I like that I can keep dreaming of trying to accomplish more in a, in a capitalist society. I like that I can try to get my star to shine a little brighter, inspire others to have their stars shine a little brighter too. And I'm also okay with, you know, others achieving more success than I ever will. And, and, you know, I just like being able to entertain the possibility that maybe I can get, you know, some more hope, man. I said that earlier, hope. We need hope. Meet sex need it. We need to live in the real world. Communism, it, it's just, it's just not real. It doesn't, it's not real to me as, as far as like lining up with human nature. Right? All this shit goes away. It just does, ah, fuck it. Dreams die with communism. What is the point of living? If best case scenario, you just have to work until you die and never have any more than, you, than what you need to survive. We don't live in hunter-gatherer societies anymore. Why try and move back in that direction? That ship sailed, thank God. Think life would be simpler and you'd be happier if all you had to worry about was harvesting rice every day? No way. You'd be miserable. Pol Pot's dream was a shitty, stupid dream. He was a fucking terrible human being. If hell is real, I hope he fucking is burning there. Fuck Pol Pot. Fuck Stalin. Fuck Mao Zedong. Fuck communism. And praise Bojangles. Let's ho- head over to the top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one, while well, the Cambodian genocide you know, took uh, perhaps as high as, as many as three million lives, it's still not even the top five mass murders as far as overall death counts in the 20th century. Oh my Heck, what is wrong with us sometimes? Number two, communism's terrible. Have I mentioned that? I think I, I, think I have, maybe. Whether uh, or not any of the shitlords like Stalin, Mao, or Pol Pot ever tried legit Marxist communism or not will always be up for debate. But you know what? I mean, what, if you don't get the formula just right, it's gulags and genocide, killing fields? Nah, let's, let's, just, let's just end it. Karl Marx, why did you have to do that? Uh, number three, Pol Pot was a teacher who didn't like teachers. Like so many dictators, he didn't want thinkers around. Why is that? Probably because they were smart enough to see through his stupid bullshit. Tens of thousands of intellectuals, doctors, teachers, political dissidents uh, were executed during his purges. Losing those intellectuals crippled Cambodia's recovery efforts after his regime was toppled. Number four, this is just another suck that illustrates how wicked we meat sacks can be to one another. Tribalism is more than real. It's the history of humanity. Pol Pot started by getting rid of everyone who wasn't like him. And then, well, you know, he also got rid of others like him. But his purges began with tribalism. So, so maybe no more tribalism. Number five, new info. In the years following the calamity, Cambodia began opening up the international community again with survivors sharing their stories and recollections. If you want to learn more about the Khmer Rouge and what they did to Cambodia, watch the 1984 British biographical drama film called The Killing Fields. Based off victims' firsthand experiences, the film brought worldwide attention to what was just a few years prior, an internationally neglected genocide. At the 57th Academy Awards, it received seven Oscar nominations including Best Picture at 1-3. At the 38th British Academy Film Awards, it won eight BAFTAs, including Best Film, Best Actor. 1999, the British Film Institute voted The Killing Fields the 100th greatest British film of the 20th century. There's another good movie you can watch that I watched uh, based on this subject. Watched it last night. First, They Killed My Father. Angelina Jolie directed 2017 historical thriller. Set in 1975, the film depicts a five-year-old girl forced to be trained as a child soldier while her siblings are sent to labor camps during the Khmer Rouge regime. Powerful flick. 
especially since shit like that is still going on today in the world. Man, education. We have to keep learning. We have to keep evolving. We have to become better problem solvers, figure out how to allocate resources more effectively, prevent desperate times that call for desperate measures. We have to keep studying history so don't repeat these same terrible mistakes. We have to work hard to prevent totalitarian motherfuckers like Pol Pot from ever gaining power again. The more logical we are, the better we get at critical thinking, the less needless suffering will occur. I truly believe that. Hail fucking Nimrod. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge genocide sucked. Man, what an intense tale. I'm glad I know about it. Scary. Uh, big thanks to the Time Suck team. Thanks to Queen of the Suck, Lindsay Cummins, High Priest of the Suck, Harmony Vela Camp, Reverend Dr. Paisley, the Bit Elixir app design crew, Logan and Casey at Spicy Club, running that bad magic merch.com. Sweet ass store. The script keeper, Zach Flannery. Uh, check out the Colts and Curious private Facebook group if you want to make some new friends. Thank you to the Countess of the Colt, Liz Hernandez, for being a kick ass administrator. Well over 15,000 meat sacks to meet in there now. Thank you to the all-seeing eyes of the cult helping Liz out. Ellie Darling, Robbie Erickson, Megan Howell, Danny Ryan, Jacob Carey, Juan Carlos Ramirez Darius. Also, the Time Suck Discord channel via the Time Suck app. You can get in there, meet over 5,000 goofy-ass meat sack suckers. Thank you, Beefsteak, for keeping Discord weird and fun. Uh, next week on Time Suck, we return to the Idaho Panhandle for a hard look at the Ruby Ridge incident that culminated into tragedy in August of 1992. Some have called it uh, you know, the day the modern militia movement was born in America, while others considered among the most disastrous examples of government overreach in recent U.S. history. One thing's for sure, everything that could have gone wrong with Ruby Ridge certainly did. Ruby Ridge, the location of an 11-day standoff with the former Green Beret and Aryan Nation sympathizer Randy Weaver, his young family, and a friend named Kevin Harris, who were in an isolated cabin in Boundary County, Idaho. The Weavers had absorbed a number of anti-New World Order conspiracy books, reinterpreted a bunch of apocalyptic Christian texts for the modern era, or modern era. They'd moved away from society to the isolated cabin in an attempt to save themselves from what they saw as an evil Zionist occupied government that was cracking down on good Christians in an effort to create a one world government. Sometimes these kind of details get lost in their story. Uh, they were huge fucking wackadoodles. <laughs> Randy was crazy as shit. Uh, must have felt as if the end of days prophecies were coming true with 400 law enforcement officers, including local and regional police, FBI, U.S. federal marshals, were called in to handle the weavers. The circus on Ruby Ridge included helicopters, tank treaded armored personnel carriers, anti-government protesters from around the nation. Even Geraldo Rivera showed up. In the end, uh, Weaver's wife, Vicky, who supposedly had visions of an event like this, and his 14-year-old son, Sammy, and U.S. Marshal William Deegan killed during the siege. So join us next week as we investigate the appalling details of this crazy Ruby Ridge government standoff from 1992. And now it is time for today's The Time Sucker Updates. Updates? Get your Time Sucker Updates. First update from Super Northern Sucker, Mike Malador, with a message to keep on fighting through the tough times. Mike writes, Dear Suckmaster, Lord Cummins, the third Esquire, long-time listener, first time writing in. Disclaimer, the first bit might be a little hard to listen to, so buckle up, mother suckers. First off, I would love it if you could give a shout-out to my beautiful, strong, and intelligent wife, Veronica. Hello, Veronica. We've been married for almost eight years. She's about to give birth to our son, Elijah. She's due on the 4th of March. We married very young. She had a little girl, Allison, at the age of 15 that I'm proud to call my daughter. I know, I know. That's his words, not mine. Uh, that's a little young to have a kid, but that didn't stop my wife from becoming the best mother I could have asked for in a partner. So throughout our lives as a young couple, we have never stopped trying to get pregnant. Uh, my wife has had four separate miscarriages. After the last one, because of how far along she was, I could tell that it had taken a toll on her. And we both felt like we could never have another kid. We live in Alaska. I'm a mechanic in the North Slope oil field, so I'm gone two weeks at a time. I got a call from my wife while at work early last year. She told me that my cousin had given birth to a boy, a boy that was malnourished, had heroin, alcohol, and marijuana in his system. You know, the child services was there at the time, granted his temporary custody of this little boy. When she brought him home and FaceTimed me, it was as if those miscarriages never happened. She was glowing and ecstatic to be taken care of him. Well, my cousin got sent to jail after making no attempt to visit the baby or go to meetings. And, well, you know, getting high as fuck and assaulting my aunt, rambling on about how the shadow people told her to, uh, told him to kill her. So needless to say, we now have full guardianship of this little man. And are in the process of adopting him. His name will be changed to Wyatt. Uh, two months after gaining custody of him, we found out we were pregnant again. Now both of us were excited but skeptical due to our history. 
She is now eight months pregnant and due in a few weeks, and we couldn't be happier. Your podcast seriously helped us get through some tough times. When I felt like I couldn't laugh or put a smile on my face, I turned uh, some mother suck and time suck on, and God damn it, you made it happen every single time. Thank you for everything you do. For every meat sack out there who's going through a tough time, just know that there's a community of people here with time suck that are rooting for you. Hopefully, we'll be able to catch you at a live suck or stand-up show one day. You've one of my favorite comics for years. That's all I've got. So hail Nimrod, praise Zafina, Bojangles, and God damn it, keep on sucking. I love you, Mike. Uh, you and Veronica are some fighters. I like it. Man, keep doing what you're doing. Doing some good in the world. Bringing this child up the right way. Working hard, not giving up. It is impressive. Uh, Nimrod, Nimrod uh, approves mightily. Next up, uh, top shelf meat sack, Shandy Martin. Let's us know... Uh, some shame is coming to the Golden State Killer. I love it. Shandy writes uh, with the subject of micropene exposed. And then, hello, Master Sucker. I was listening to the podcast Three Spooked Girls and they did an update on Joseph D'Angelo. Supposedly, the judge asked for photos of his micropene to be submitted into evidence, which makes me happy. I'm not sure if it was actually carried out as the defense was saying it's a violation of his Fifth Amendment rights, but imagine having his micropene blown up to poster size to show, to show the court. Fucking hilarious. Plus, I figured you'd enjoy this as well. Keep up the good work. Time Suck is what made me start listening to podcasts to begin with, and now I'm obsessed. Time Suck's my first love, of course. Shout out to Faithful Spaces or Andy Rue for turning me on to the suck. Love the suck and scared to death. Look forward to new episodes every week. Keep on sucking and hail Lucifina. Shandy. Thank you, Shandy. Thanks for listening to Scared to Death as well. Thanks for continuing to listen to Time Suck and for passing that along. And thank you, Andy Rue, OG Time Sucker. Uh, next up, two updates left. Uh, next up, a Joseph Duncan update from super sucker Sam Wagner, who writes, I was wondering when you were going to get around to sucking Duncan. My brother and I went to school with the grony kids. My brother was friends with Slade. I remember sitting at home watching their Amber Alerts going across the TV screen. The way that it was initially reported made it seem like a love triangle murder. Excuse me. So it was assumed that the children were reasonably safe with the family member. In the following days, it was discovered that they were kidnapped by a pedophile serial killer. Our close family friend was one of the sheriff's deputies that was investigating the case. He never told us anything, but you could see that working that case took a toll on his mental health. I remember putting amber ribbons on trees around school for Shasta and Dylan. It was the first time I experienced the sadness that pure evil leaves in its wake. I remember when they announced Slade's death, my brother was stunned. He was in sixth grade, had to process that one of his friends was dead, and he was never coming back to school, and that not only does evil exist, but it doesn't discriminate. Uh, my brother is almost 30 now, has a wife and a daughter, and refuses to go tent camping because he's afraid that his daughter will be taken in their sleep. Coeur d'Alene was a safe place up until that point. On Halloween, we would go trick-or-treating for miles without adult supervision. I never felt scared walking to school or riding my bike down to the lake with my friends in the summertime. After Duncan kidnapped the gronies, my sleepy little town was never the same. Wherever I went, there was always that joy, stealing thought that I could be kidnapped and killed. Whenever we went up 4th July Pass, we would pass their vacant home. The empty windows always seemed extra dark inside. The house was vacant for years until it was finally demolished, which was oddly relieving. It was like destroying a dictator's statue. It was freeing, and the man had no power here anymore. I still live in CDA, have a wife and 10-month-old daughter, and even though Duncan's evil reign is over, I still have that joy-stealing thought in the back of my mind, but now it's for my wife and daughter. I am always exhaustingly vigilant when I'm out with my family in crowded places or public areas. Joseph Duncan didn't just destroy the lives of one family. He robbed an entire city's children of their innocence. I'm glad that sick son of a bitch is locked up with no chance of getting out. It'd be nice if they just fucking, or sorry, I added the F. It'd be nice if they just killed him already, though. Sam Wagner. Well, thank you, Sam, for reminding us how many people these pieces of shit victimize. Uh, yeah, I hope we hear about Duncan dying soon. Um, uh, just so you know, uh, sometimes, and this is petty and probably doesn't really accomplish much, but sometimes I still go to his blog and I leave posts. I leave posts about all the fun things I get to do because I'm free and not in prison. And I remind him how he, he will never get to do any of those things ever again. And, and, and I make my life even better. I lie. According to my post, I live near the ocean. I walk on the beach a lot. I enjoy the sunshine, the water. There's a good taco place. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not as cold as it is where he is. And I, apparently, I live around uh, a lot of cool restaurants where the food is the best food on the planet. It's delicious. And I, you know, let him know how good it is. I let him know that I have, uh, uh, you know, a lot more time than I actually do in life to have uh, tons of sex and, you know, super awesome sex with my wife. And, uh, and I hope he reads these and I hope they fucking torture him. So I don't know, you know, if you want to do that, but it feels good for me. Last email coming in from young kick-ass meat sack, Faith McBrien. Going to end on a, on a good one today. Faith writes, hello, master sucker, king of the suck, all of good stuff. My name is Faith. I'm 16. I'm writing in to tell you how a comment you made in your brother's grim suck touched me and my dad. He's not my biological father, but he is my dad. 
His name is Steven, and he is by far the most amazing person I know and will ever know. My biological parents succumbed to addiction. I was homeless for all of my childhood up until that point. My mom, my four brothers, and me would sleep wherever we could, friends, relatives, until we couldn't anymore. It was a dangerous environment, parties every single night, strange people coming in and out, drunk and high. I took care of all my siblings since I can remember. In third grade, I met a girl named Sarah. Her parents, Karen and Steve, realized I was in a bad situation, took care of me the best they could without fully taking me in, so not to scare my mother. My mom finally realized that she couldn't take care of us anymore, so she let us go. My brothers went to live with my grandparents in North Carolina, and Karen and Steve finally got legal custody of me. Last November, Karen and Sarah left. This was extremely difficult for me because Sarah was my best friend for five years straight. She brought me into a place that I felt safe in for the first time in my life, and Karen, she told me that she would never leave me or let me go, which is and always will be one of my biggest anxieties, people I love and trust leaving. So many people have walked out of my life like it was nothing, leaving me to wonder why and think so hard and so much that I turn it into my fault believing that there is something wrong with me, making people want to leave. Karen leaving deepened that anxiety in me, but Steve stayed. He has done nothing but be the best dad I've ever known, the biggest supporter I could ever ask for. I sent him the timestamp of you talking about people taking in kids that weren't theirs, and it made us both deeply emotional. Difference maker, you said. Those words always stick with us. Thank you, Dan. You strengthened our relationship with your words. I couldn't be more thankful. Absolutely love your podcast. Find myself re-listening to episodes when there's not a new one. Well, I love it, Faith. Love you. Love the relationship you and Steve have, man. Yeah, you don't need to be uh, blood to be an awesome parent. So hug your dad for me. Sounds like Steve is a fucking champion. Uh, Love what you just shared. Uh, You know, glad glad you have Steve. I hope life just gets better and better for you. And you can, you know, put all this, uh, you know, uh, uh, things that you've dealt with behind you more and more as you go as you go forward. You know, you had a rough beginning, but but it sounds like you're doing pretty well now. And it sounds like a lot of that is thanks to Steve. So thank you both, and hail Nimrod to you all. Next time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Have a great week, everybody. If you're able to take over a country, please don't kill the intellectuals. Please don't uh, make everyone else starve and work in super shitty jungle rice farms. Uh, Instead, how about, I don't know, how about you just kind of just try and keep on sucking? Hey, I'm good at stuff. Are you good at stuff? I'm some good at some other stuff that's different than the stuff that you're good at. But we should do the same stuff and at the same level all the time. Yay, communism!